one. So we're going to get started. We did just launch a pre-survey. So if you can go ahead and please fill that out, that'd be greatly appreciated. So I think we can go ahead, welcome everyone to our 2021 Philadelphia Epilepsy Education Conference. My name is Seamus and I am our Greater Philadelphia Resource Coordinator and so happy to be here with you this morning. Um, again, there is a pre-survey. If you could please fill that out, we greatly appreciated it. Just a few questions and should be popped up on your screen. So at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to our awesome president and CEO, Missy Dalloway. Thanks Seamus. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 2021 Philadelphia Epilepsy Education Conference. I'm so glad to, uh, to have you with us this morning. Um, you know, as we are uh, right about to kick off uh, November, which is National Epilepsy Awareness Month, uh, we really think that there's no better thing that we can do than to come together to continue our epilepsy education. So uh, thank you for being here. And, um, and yeah, we can uh, go ahead and, and kick off our conference this morning. So a few quick housekeeping notes, uh, your audio and video will be muted and turned off for the entirety of the conference. So you can uh, sit back and relax and, um, and enjoy uh, our program that we have planned for you this morning. Um, there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please utilize that to, to put in any questions that you have as they pop up during the presentations. Um, you won't be interrupting anyone. All of the questions will be held uh, till the end of our presentations where we'll have Q&A. So please feel free to pop your questions in there as they come up um, or just pop in the chat and, and say hello and let us know that you're with us here this morning. So before we um, you know, really get into our program today, uh, just a few things that I wanted to go over with you, um, you know, kind of as we head into November, um, as we really ramp up our awareness efforts and um, try and spread as much you know, public understanding of epilepsy as possible, uh, I think first and foremost, where we always love to begin is in reminding you that you are not alone um, in your journey with epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy is often thought of as a rare disorder, uh, but as you can see with some of these statistics on the screen, um, it's actually quite common. Um, one in 10 people will experience a seizure at some point in their lifetime. And it's estimated that one in 26 people will develop epilepsy. So, um, you know, it's, that's actually quite common. Um, but, you know, we, we really think that the reason why epilepsy is regarded as a, a rare disorder is because people don't talk about it. Um, you know, unless you, someone is to witness you have a seizure, there's really nothing that, you know, identifies you as someone living with epilepsy, um, unless you talk about it and you share your story and your experiences with epilepsy. And, um, and we really think that talking about epilepsy is how we can really, you know, further understanding around epilepsy and, um, and you know, kind of increase public uh, awareness and and uh, and that understanding. So that that's our goal for November. So we encourage you to talk about epilepsy and share your story and uh, and help us raise awareness together. <clears throat> so a little bit about the EFEPA. Um, as you can see with this map on the screen, um, our office is located in Philadelphia, but we serve the 18 counties of Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, so we go all the way up to the scranton Wilkesbury area, out to Lancaster, the Lehigh Valley, and everywhere in between. We are a patient advocacy group. Um, so essentially where the doctor appointment ends, that's where we come in. We are here for you and your family to support you um, in your journey with epilepsy however we can. We provide a wide range of free support services, educational programs, resources and referrals. Um, we are here for you as your friends and your partners um, in the fight against epilepsy. 
as mentioned, um, our programs and services. So um, they're uh, bulleted out here for you on the screen. This is, you know, just a sampling of all that we offer at the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern PA, um, some of our kind of key programs, um, our seizure recognition and first aid trainings. Um, our resource coordinators like Seamus go into our schools, uh, businesses, they work with first responders and law enforcement uh, to lead trainings to help you recognize the signs and symptoms of seizures and how to react and respond accordingly and provide seizure first aid. Um, it's one of the most important things that we do at the foundation. Um, if, if, if you'd like to have a training set up at your school or at your company, uh, please reach out to us. We'd, we'd absolutely love to be able to do that. Um, we offer monthly support group meetings all throughout our region. They're currently still being held virtually over Zoom. So you can really jump into any that fits your schedule. Um, we host a wide range of community building and awareness raising events. We do four walk to epilepsy events. Uh, we have our annual golf outing, our Mardi Gras gala. Uh, there is an event for you um, that we'd love to get you involved in. Um, we offer a wide range of educational conferences and webinars, such as uh, this conference that you're joining this morning. We have a ton of educational opportunities planned for November. Uh, Seamus is going to be going into those more at the end of the program. We definitely encourage you to get involved in as many as you can. Um, <clears throat> a wide range of information and referrals, uh, medical health, uh, mental health, legal referrals, um, our youth and young adult services, um, we, we offer every August our beloved Camp Achieve. That's a week-long sleepaway camp for children ages 8 to 17 living with epilepsy. We do a young adult retreat weekend, an adult wellness weekend, um, some really great you know, socialization programs. Um, our new camp and community outreach coordinator is kind of revamping our Youth Achieve program, uh, which kind of keeps the spirit and community of camp going all year long. Um, so you name it, we have uh, programs and services for you and your family, uh, no matter your age or stage of uh, life or diagnosis, um, we have something for you and, and we encourage you to, to get involved because we are here for you. <clears throat> Next, I wanted to quickly uh, give a huge thank you to our sponsors. Um, our sponsors are really, you know, who makes our work possible. Um, they've made this program possible today, but so much of the invaluable work that we do with our community members. We are so grateful for, uh, for all of their generosity and all of their support in our work. So first and foremost, we have our presenting sponsor, Greenwich Biosciences. Greenwich Biosciences sponsored all of our conferences and webinars um, across our series this year. Uh, we're so grateful for all that they do to help us. Um, so I wanted to invite my friend Jen from Greenwich Biosciences to say a few words. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to say thanks for having us. Have a great day and look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Thanks, Jen. I'm looking forward to that, too. <laughs> Next, we have our conference series sponsors. ASI. Um, ASI sponsored all of our conferences um, across our series this year. We are super grateful to ASI uh, for all of their um, work in, in helping our epilepsy community. I actually don't think that we have um, a friend on from ASI, so just thank you to them for, for all of their help. Next, we have our additional conference series sponsor, UCB. Um, again, UCB um, sponsored all of our conferences across our series this year. Huge thanks to UCB, and uh, now it's my honor to introduce our friend Mindy to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you all today and to share just a few words of support. Um, I know it's not only for the people living with ep epilepsy, but it's for the caregivers and the families. And we stand by you and support you every day along this journey. Um, I work for UCB and we are inspired by patients and driven by science. Every day, it's our priority to improve the lives of people living with epilepsy. Together with you, we refuse to let this disease get the best of us. And we're going to continue to create awareness, wear our purple, orange when it's almost Halloween, and spread education and walk in support of everyone living with epilepsy. So just know that we at UCB are committed to advancing research to improve the lives of people living with epilepsy. And thank you for having us. Enjoy the conference. Thanks, Mindy. 
And last but not least, we have our vendor sponsor today, BioCodex. Uh, BioCodex has generous, generously sponsored our Philadelphia Epilepsy Education Conference. Um, huge thanks for your partnership. And now I'd like to introduce my friend Holly to say a few words. Hi there. Thank you um, for having us as well. We are very excited to support this educational initiative. Um, our goal is really to help epilepsy teams help patients, their families, um, and their, you know, their greater network of teachers and everyone that's involved in this journey. Um, our, we really want to make sure that we're the reason each and every day that you feel like you're welcomed, seen, heard, valued, loved, and supported. Um, so thank you again to the Epilepsy Foundation um, for having us today. And uh, we're always here to support you. So thank you. Thanks, Holly. And at this point, I am going to pass it back to your Greater Philadelphia Resource Coordinator, Seamus Morgan, to uh, take it away from here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Missy. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome uh, again to our conference. And thank you to our wonderful sponsors for supporting the foundation and the epilepsy community. So I just wanted to take you through our conference schedule today. So as you can see, we're just wrapping up welcome and introductions. And at 9.15, we're gonna have our first speaker, Dr. Tiffany Fisher, speaking about disparities and gaps in healthcare and epilepsy, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. And then we're gonna have a little break. And then following Dr. Fisher, we're gonna have Dr. Anna Graf. Um, presenting on memory, cognition, and neuropsychology with time as well for questions and answers. Then we'll have another break. And then our third speaker of the day will be Dr. Armina Almali speaking on updates on clinical trials and research with another chance for questions and answers for her. And then one last break. And then our final speaker of the day will be Kelly McKee from 1215 to 1255, speaking from OVR on vocational rehabilitation services and programs with, again, another chance to ask her some questions. And then we will have our upcoming events and closing remarks. So taking us into our first speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Tiffany Fisher who has an MD, PhD, and is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at Pennsylvania State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. She is a board certified neurologist and epileptologist. Dr. Fisher attended Hampton University as a Gates Millennium and Student Enhancement in Mathematics and Science Scholar where she received a BS in Mathematics. She earned a PhD in Neuroscience in 2007 from Wake Forest University Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and then pursued her medical degree at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she remained for residency, serving as a chief resident in neurology and an epilepsy fellow prior to joining the faculty at Penn State. Dr. Fisher currently serves as a faculty co-advisor for both the Student Interest Group in Neurology and Student National Medical Association at Penn State, as well as recent appointment as the Associate Vice Chair for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Fisher is active in the Neurology Department as a member of the Research and Curriculum Committees. Her research focuses on patient outcomes utilizing specialized technique on stereo electro, but stereo electroencephalography for invasive seizure monitoring in patients who have a responsive neurostimulator implanted for seizure control, as well as health dispar disparities for intractable epilepsy using these advanced therapeutics. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Fisher. Good morning. Thank you so much, Seamus, for that introduction and having me here this morning. And uh, good job with the stereoencephalography. Uh, we call it stereo EEG for short. So oh, <laughs> thank you. you. <laughs> I appreciate um, your help on that. <laughs> um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and we yeah, can get started. So it says that I'm sharing 
Okay, we're gonna go. And I'm hopeful that you can see this disparities and gaps in epilepsy. Uh, yes, we can. Great. All right. So again, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm, I guess, not so new it here at Penn State, originally from North Carolina, and it's my pleasure to talk to you about disparities and gaps in epilepsy. In no way am I an expert, but um, I want to talk about how we as the clinician and as the healthcare providers, as well as the healthcare systems, need to mobilize and meet you at where you stand being our patients. So I want to begin with the concept definitions on exactly what is health disparity, health equity, and then those social determinants of health of how we assess where we're being um, these stages of inequality or disparities. And then we'll specifically focus on health disparities and epilepsy. And then finally, how can we operationalize our health equity principles? So health inequality or disparity is any measurable difference in health that varies across individuals. And it could be according to socially relevant groupings. It lacks any moral judgment on whether those observed differences are fair or just. When we think of health equity, it is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential, and no one is disadvantaged from achieving that because of their social position or other socially determined circumstances. And these are reflected in the differences in our quality of life, our length of life and death, disability, the rates of disease, severity of disease and access to treatment. So when we think of equality, we have this picture here. We have three individuals, a man, a woman and a child. And in the first picture on the left, all of them are standing on a box and they're looking at a soccer game. So here, everyone benefits from the same support. So we know that the treatment is equal. When we think of equity, we're looking at that same game, but now everyone has the support to view that game as it's needed. So now the male doesn't need a box. The woman needs one box to see the game equally. And now the child needs two boxes that see that same game equally. So that's what we're thinking about in forms of equity. When we come and we think about inequality or disparities in healthcare, we know that there have been classically disenfranchised groups, and that can be based on racial and ethnic minorities, those living in low income household or so low social economic status, and then members of the LGBTQ plus community. They can also include our elderly, our children, um, so those are age differences, as well as those with disability or sexual orientation. So the social determinants of health include categories such as education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and those built environments, social and community context, as well as economic stability. These are the conditions and the places where people live, learn, work, and play. And these affect the wide range of health and the quality of life risk and outcomes. They represent largely non-medical factors, such as your housing, transportation, and poverty that we know affect our health. And these highlight the importance of upstream factors, typically outside of healthcare delivery, that are necessary to reduce health disparities and maintain healthy communities and populations. So now when we take that same picture and we're gonna add justice and apply justice, when we look at justice, we no longer need varying support because we have removed the barrier. So we've removed the cause of the inequality and that was addressed. How do we go about that? And we'll talk about that and touch on that a little bit later. Right now, we're gonna focus on health disparity and epilepsy. So there was an initial evaluation in 2002 with a panel of experts at the National Institute of Health. And from that, two systemic articles or reviews were published. Out of those, we come to find out that there's insufficient data. And therefore, we need additional research to address these health disparities, specifically in epilepsy. 
So the subsequent findings from there have been produced by the Academy, American Academy of Neurology and Cure Against Epilepsy. Again, when we look at the specific social determinants of health and how those affect epilepsy, when we examine gender, women have been shown to have a higher use of neurology care versus the general practitioner for epilepsy. But the gender differences have not been shown amongst children with epilepsy. Looking at age, the elderly and young are vulnerable populations, but again, additional research is needed. When we take in race, we know that African-Americans have higher rates of acute care, higher rates of death, and less advanced treatments such as epilepsy surgery. African-Americans also have lower levels of knowledge about their treatment options. So my focus is intractable epilepsy. I wanna know how health disparities affect our intractable epileptic patients and what we can do to uh, mitigate those health disparities. So we know that intractable, intractable epilepsy is the persistence of seizures despite at least two anti-seizure drugs. It has an annual incidence or occurrence of three per 50,000 patients and accounts for more than 75% of our healthcare costs for epilepsy. Patients with intractable temporal lobe epilepsy often benefit from surgical management with the anterior temporal lobectomy, with the initial study showing that 60 to 80% become seizure free. In the real world studies, we know that that number is as high as 90%. Therefore, surgical intervention is far more superior than continued medical treatment. So despite the advent of multiple medications across uh, year since the 1980s with novel mechanisms of action, the rate of intractable epilepsy remains the same. A third of our patients, you, have intractable epilepsy. So when we look at the health disparity with intractable epilepsy, we know that there was a study conducted uh, by McLeckland and colleagues that looked at U.S. practice parameters over 16 years taken from um, in that time frame, the 1998 to 2003, but they looked at 16 years beyond that. And what they found that was, well, what they found, excuse me, was that there was a reduced likelihood of surgery if you were African-American, and that was nearly 50% reduction to have surgery, or you were of older age. There was increased likelihood of surgery if you were also privately insured, such that you were 85% more likely to undergo surgery than if you had Medicare, Medicaid, self-pay, no charge, or other types of insurance or coverage of the cost. There was a similar study conducted by uh, the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2005 for a community in Alabama showing that there was 60% less chance to receive surgery for African-Americans compared to uh, non-Hispanic white individuals. There were some limitations of the study. Of course, there was a small study size uh, with the study in the UAB. There's distrust of the provider and incomplete collection of demographic data, as well as miseducation. So when the UCLA took individuals and they wanted to know what their perceptions were for their intractable epilepsy, as well as surgery, they used um, groups of individuals and they basically took four categories. You had adults with intractable epilepsy, teens with intractable epilepsy, their parents, as well as African-Americans with intractable epilepsy. And what they found in these groups was that there was a distrust of their provider, number one, that the provider downplayed or discouraged them or either saw epilepsy surgery in a negative light and that was passed on to the patient. The patient was miseducated about the outcomes of epilepsy surgery and therefore they thought that the risk greatly outweighed the benefit of undergoing that surgery. So what are the factors that affect uh, our patients and their outlook of epilepsy surgery? And this was uh, found in neurology and conducted by Nathan Gutierrez um, in 2018. And they look at factors such as, they call it facets, fear, access, communication, education, trust, and social support and physician bias. And they took two groups, African-American patients and Hispanic patients. And what they found is that 
basically there's differences in these facets among these two groups. So as we know, our underrepresented groups are not monolithic. They vary in how they feel and how they view certain aspects of the healthcare system. So with African-Americans, we know that the biggest factor was access as well as fear, whereas with Hispanic patients, again, it's access, but it's communication. Now, when we look at health disparity in epilepsy and we look at social economic status, patients with epilepsy have a lower household income, educational level, employment opportunities, and overall health status. And that social economic deprivation has been shown to likely increase the occurrence of epilepsy and then constrain the access as well as the adherence to treatment. Lack of insurance and region are also key barriers to seeing a neurologist for epilepsy among adults. And we'll go into this a little bit later. And then poverty is a key barrier to accessing anti-seizure medication. And it may be one of the reasons that underrepresented groups can be non-compliant with medications. So when we look at the regional health disparities, we know that patients with epilepsy residing in regions outside of the Northeast are less likely to visit a neurologist or epilepsy provider. And that the strongest associations are for those patients who are living in the South. And that's because it's the stroke belt, which in turn is the epilepsy belt, as well as the dementia belt. And all of this lies in together. So we know that there are varying ways that we can affect health disparities when it comes to epilepsy, whether that's regional, uh, whether that's social economic status, looking at race, looking at gender, as well as age. So the Institute of Medicine recommends some things that we can address. And first of all, there needs to be a surveillance of epilepsy, not only in a case-wise basis, but in terms of use, cost, access, and quality of care. We need to look at risk factors as well as patient-centered outcomes. So what are the future areas of research when it comes to health disparities in epilepsy? We need to look at implicit racial bias in epilepsy care, as well as effects on outcomes. We know that there are patient and provider bias, whereas underrepresented groups are seen as less educated, um, and therefore that affects their epilepsy care. We need to understand how intersectionality, such as gender, race, sexual orientation, poverty, and stigma affect the care experiences of you, our patients, and the outcomes of people with epilepsy. We need to investigate the most adequate or the best pathways of transition of care from pediatrics to adulthood. And I know for most of my patients that come from pediatrics, as, because I'm an adult provider, um, it's a huge slap in the face. It's, it's, it's a reality that needs to be reset. Usually the neurologist or epileptologist is a one-stop shop in pediatrics, whereas that care is more parcelated or, and when you um, reach adulthood. And so there needs to be that transition period that we have so that we can prepare our pediatric patients as well as their, their adult parents about how that care changes. We need to assess caregiver fatigue, uh, understand that, that it often plays a vital role in patient care and the provider relationship. So again, we are bringing in this facets, the fear, access, communication barriers, education, trust, social support, and physician bias. Here they outline examples of how we can measure each individual tenant and then also intervene on these. So when it comes to fear, we can look at pain, anxiety, symptom scale, and we can intervene by performing patient education and empowerment, um, looking at patient testimonials for each individual patient. I think it, it, our patients fare better or they listen more maybe when they hear it from another patient that's been in a similar circumstance. We can also intervene in a community by having educational events such as these. How can we affect access? So we can look at provider bias education, uh, use of a social worker for support, and telemedicine use. And we need to look at the number of surgeries at level four uh, NAC, which is the National Association of Epilepsy Centers, and how referred minority groups or underrepresented groups versus non-Hispanic white patients, 
how they are doing, how often do they under, undergo surgery, even when they have similar insurance. We can look at communication barriers with the use of live language interpreters versus phone and measure those outcomes, the use of community volunteers within our clinic to help communicate, and then the measuring physician time and interactions amongst underrepresented uh, patients. So we want to know, do those physicians spend more time with the patients because of the communication barrier? Do they educate them more or are they limiting their time because there is a communication barrier? Then we can look at and implement and intervene by looking at patient provider racial concordance. Now we know that there is a lack of underrepresented physician or providers within neurology. And we're trying to address that, but that's gonna take time. So most of our patient provider experiences are gonna be discordant in race. So again, we need to address that by providing provider bias education. So when it comes to education of our patients, we need to make sure that they understand the procedure as well as the visit outcomes. Um, and then we can use visual aids and handouts to explain those procedures. And we also need to increase trust. So we can use a distrust scale to measure outcomes. And then we need to engage our community and use those patient testimonials as previously stated. And then finally, with social support and physician bias, we can evaluate the post-surgery social resources and number of surgeries that our patients are undergoing, and then look at physician education and knowledge about that bias. So here we can intervene with pharmacist follow-up for medication compliance and side effects. Again, provider bias education, look at provider cultural competence education, and then follow up with close psychological support as well as support with the social worker. So when we think of achieving health equity, we wanna look at three broad categories. We wanna look at assurance, assessment, and policy development. Policy development is looking at how we can change the community and laws to give better access to those with uh, uh, that, with health disparities based on social and economic status, race, and all those other social determinants of health. When we look at assurance, we need to make sure we have equitable access. We have a diverse and skilled workforce. We improve and innovate through evaluation, research, and quality improvement, and that we maintain strong organizational infrastructure for public health. And then finally, we need to assess these with monitoring of the population's health, and then investigate, diagnose, and address health hazards and root causes. So how can we operationalize these health equity principles? We can do that on a community level by identifying how health disparities in a community affect specific groups. And we need to recognize that each person has their own racial and ethnic biases and learn how to recognize when a policy or environment may exclude a person or group. Then you need to show, show respect to people of all groups and make efforts to involve those groups in acting change. And we need to do that when we start the projects, not bring you in in the middle or at the end of a project, but engaging you in the beginning to determine how best to structure our projects, how best to structure our research. We can frequently evaluate how well the policies aimed at health equity are working, and we need to make the necessary changes when we identify that those policies may be ineffective to change them to something that is most effective. We need to encourage people to contribute using their talents, their time, as well as their gifts. When we look at a clinic oper operationalization of these health equity principles, we need to provide health seminars and courses that are specific to the needs of certain ethnic communities and racial groups. Provide low cost services to those living in a low income household or of lower social economic status. Use mobile health screenings to help those who may not have access to transportation. We can also use telehealth in those circumstances or telemedicine. We can offer evening or late night or even weekend health appointments to those who work long hours and are unable to access care. 
provide better education, testing and treatment to access to communities, particularly impacted by certain conditions or diseases. And then we need to consider a multidisciplinary approach that involves not only the epileptologist, but the psychiatrist, nutritionist, psychologist, as well as the primary care physician. So when we think about projects and or research that we're conducting when it comes to health disparities and inequity in epilepsy or any health related field, we need to use concrete numbers to specify our goals such as improving clinic access by 25 or more percent for children and youth in epilepsy, as all of our efforts should be measurable. We need to implement quality improvement projects or qualitative research methods to analyze the patient and family and provider feedback at regularly scheduled intervals to update our effort measures. And then we need to collect demographic and baseline population data. Many times this data is lacking, is lacking when it comes to who's undergoing epilepsy surgery, is lacking to who's having advanced therapeutics implanted, such as our vagal nerve stimulator, our responsive neurostimulator, as well as our deep brain stimulators. We need to assess telehealth visits and other virtual workshop for education effectiveness, such as reducing the no-show rate and expansion of care to rural remote patients. So conclusions from here are that health disparities are preventable differences and the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Health equity arises from access to the social determinants of health, specifically from wealth, power, and prestige. Our social determinants of health are the conditions and the places where we live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health and quality of life risk and outcomes. There needs to be strategic investigations to address multiple factors for patients with epilepsy, which include race, gender, age, sexual orientation or identity, social economic status, region, and the intersectionality of these. Health equity is achieved by policy development as well as operationalization at the community, clinic, organizational level, while utilizing the individual talents and resources. And we need to continue to assess the effectiveness of policies and projects, as well as make changes when needed. So I'll take any questions at this time. Perfect, thank you so much, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fisher. And if, yeah, if anyone does have any questions at this time, um, please go ahead and submit them through the chat box and we'd be happy to, to try and answer your questions. So one question we had pop in was, what more can we do at the EFEPA to reduce these disparities? So I think um, at the EPA, you are our direct contact with the community. And I think that partnering with uh, health organizations as well as physicians um, as that liaison between the communities so that we can figure out how to best go about um, seeing what kind of change the community needs. So I know that one thing that you're doing right now is these educational seminars. So reaching out or having the physician reach out to you and say, hey, I have a, a seminars that I wanna give. How can I uh, partner with you to um, give these for the community? Uh, what does the community, what resources do the communities lack? Um, what are you seeing on your front? Um, I think there needs to be more of a partnership um, on that basis uh, because you are in the middle, you are our liaison and their liaison. So I think that's where um, you could be vital in helping. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, great question and great answer. Um, any other questions? Well, oh, we're getting a couple thank yous, wonderful presentation.
So one person did say, this is a lot of information. Will we be able to have <clears throat> a copy of the slides? Um, so the, pre the training, this webinar is being recorded. So we will have a recording of all the presentations today, including Dr. Fisher's. Um, so we will send out the link to everyone that was, that's on today's uh, training and our uh, webinar and who uh, registered. But we still have plenty of time for more questions and answers if anyone does have any questions they'd like to ask. One person said, I've heard of the stroke belt, but never considered the possible connection with epilepsy and with dementia. Absolutely. I think it comes from there's the stroke belt. Um, and basically uh, with stroke, you can have post-stroke epilepsy. Um, that's one common form of epilepsy outside of the idiopathic or either genetic uh, components of epilepsy that frequently happens. And then you can also have vascular dementia, which comes from, of course, you having strokes. Um, or, and so that's why you'll see that dementia in, uh, in epilepsy belt connected with the stroke belt. Um, and what they're finding, interestingly, um, just going back and researching all of this, is that they've taken a study, I think that's sponsored by NIH, um, regard study that's looking at stroke in the South. And what they're finding is that if you grow up in the South, um, uh, either as a child or young adult, even if you move outside of that area um, in adulthood, your risk of stroke does not, is not reduced. So that stays with you. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if the likelihood of epilepsy as well as dementia remains the same um, for those individuals that travel outside of that region um, in adulthood. Yeah, see, I did not know that. Uh, yeah, great, great couple questions. So looks like we had another one pop in. Do you know if there are any institutions which, which offer a multidisciplinary multi approach to epilepsy patients, social workers, psychologists, et cetera? So um, most of the time, I believe your level four institutions at least have all of those within the, uh, within the uh, department. So I know at Penn State Hershey, we definitely have um, psychologists who are well-versed in epilepsy and perform all of our evaluations for our epileptic patients. We have a social worker, um, and we have psychiatrists there. We had an epilepsy psychiatrist, actually he was, he did a fellowship specifically for epilepsy patients in psychiatry. Um, and so, we have those resources there. So I imagine if you look at uh, similar institutions such as UPenn, um, the remaining level four, I don't want to start naming people, um, but the level four uh, uh, National uh, Academy of Epilepsy Centers, that they have similar access. Okay, press gaining surveys may be modified to collect additional. Um, I think that they could. Uh, the press gaining surveys could, and that's the point of looking at how we could modify them to collect um, and evaluate uh, for health disparities. Um, I believe that a lot of that information just isn't collected at this point. So it's probably a number of surveys that we could either uh, develop or either alter to um, look at how, uh, look at either demographic data as well as um, health disparities. Of course. Yeah, that's a, a, a great point. And one other question that did pop in is, what is a stroke belt? I had a stroke at birth and I've had epilepsy all of my life. Should I be concerned? And if so, how? Okay. So the stroke belt is basically based on, so it's stroke later in life, um, not at onset of birth. Um, so it's based on um, your risk factors for having stroke. Uh, so that will mean hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. Usually those are the greatest risk factors of having um, an adulthood stroke. And so that's what we call the stroke belt. 
um, is that basically in that region of the United States, there's a higher incidence of stroke. And some of the reasons why there's a higher incidence of stroke goes to the risk factors are high within that region. Um, great answer. And one person did ask, is there a way to participate in those surveys? So I'm guessing the press gaining ones. So I think there is a way, and that's where I said we need to partnership with our community and um, such as the Epilepsy Foundation um, and saying, you know, how can we utilize you um, to partnership and, and gain access to our community to see who is willing to fill out those surveys who is willing to, willing to be a um, community champion so that we can determine how best to go out within our local, our regional state and gather this information. Um, so yes, if you are willing to fill that out, sometimes, you know, not all of our patients make it to a level four epilepsy center. Matter of fact, most of our patients don't make it to a level four epilepsy center. So that's where we need to um, either go out to our community neurologists or our family medicine, um, our general practitioners to determine how we can get that feedback from our patients. Yeah, absolutely. Any way to get more into our community and, and what, um, you know, populations and, and gaps we can help, uh, you know, help identify more. And then it looks like we did kind of already have this question, but it was, do you have any suggestions on how the Epilepsy Foundation can better reach under representative populations. Um, and I think, like you said, Dr. Fisher, like uh, continuing to do more outreach and partnering with uh, like community organizations in our local communities um, could be really helpful. I don't know if there's anything else you would like to add to that. Um, not at this time. I think we're, as some of our uh, hospitals are competing and putting like this spider web, these spider ten or tentacles out um, to community hospitals. Um, they're starting to uh, gather additional information about how we can go out into the community. So I think we need to use our health systems um, as well uh, with, with part of this engagement to see how, um, how our epilepsy patients utilize our health systems and then seeing how our underrepresented groups in comparison utilize that same health system. That would be important to understand and know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, oh, we got plenty of questions rolling and this is great. Um, so one question is going back to the Southern areas, epilepsy can still affect you when you move from the South. Do you think it can be an environmental factor? I think some of it is environmental. I think some of it, um, as a neuroscientist, we learn nature versus nurture, right? So some of it is innate things that you are born with. And some of those are, na are nature that are nurture factors that are environmental that come along the way. Um, so I don't, I think it's outside of the environment. I think it's something that if, if we're in those stroke belts, like I'm from North Carolina, I'm, I'm within that stroke belt. It's a way that you are, are, are born and a way that you grow up. You grow up with certain foods, certain, certain customs, certain ideas, concepts that you may not leave in the South, even though they can be adapted and you go to a different region, you're still gonna have what, I don't eat chitlins, but you're still gonna have your chitlins. You're still gonna have your way that you make certain foods um, that may not leave that particular area. So I think that some part of that is the nature, what's innate. And then there's a little part of the nurture, the environmental factors that can change it. But what it's showing is that they're not changing that enough if you don't re leave that region um, early enough. I hope that explains that. I, that. I think that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, Next one is many times families may not know to ask for specific members of a multiple disciplinary, multiple disciplinary team. It's important to educate them about all available resources. I guess that's more a statement than a question, um, but Agreed. that's absolutely true. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. The next question we have is, have veterans been included in any studies involving disparities? Yes. So the VA system is a system all of its own, right? So when you talk about these, uh, there's this, uh, is it called national inpatient um, system 
that looks at all hospital hospital wide data for admissions. Um, but that excludes federally funded institutions and hospitals, such as your VA system. But the VA system, uh, some, in some ways, it's better equipped to handle this because they take in all of the information that maybe our other clinics, other non-federally funded hospitals don't collect. But they have looked at the VA and what their um, rates of undergoing uh, epilepsy surgery, um, I don't know, some studies, small studies about health disparities, but they have looked at some um, studies with health disparities, uh, maybe not as specific to epilepsy, but yes, with health disparities. Okay, great. Um, and then one person said, uh, support groups are an excellent resource. I learned about it from my neurologist, and this is a good way to reach individuals, definitely. Absolutely. And we offer tons of support groups um, throughout yep. our different areas. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. This is where patients learn about the latest therapeutics because either they're presenting that as the education or maybe there's another patient there that has a certain device. It could be a wearable device. Um, so I think that's a great idea. Um, and usually we as the providers, um, physicians learn about what you what interests you and what topics you want to learn more about through those um, support groups. Yes, absolutely. And one question is, is, I believe kind of more related to insurance, but how can we get insurance companies to continue to pay for oxygen and seizure saving devices? Hmm. So I imagining uh, what you're talking about is sudden explaining, unexplained death in an epilepsy. That sounds, I'm not sure. That's my assumption. Um, but uh, what you have to do is advocate as much as possible. Um, usually insurance likes to see evidence. Uh, they like to see evidence that something is this way um, or, you know, they're writing um, the insurance company and having the physician, the epileptologist write a letter um, of advocating for uh, oxygen or um, other seizure related devices. That usually sees, it seems to be one of the best avenues that I've seen. I'm sorry. To yeah, very, very sorry to hear about that. And just know at the foundation, you know, we can be I can be contacted or you can call our main office and we'll connect you with our, your local resource coordinator. Um, and we're here to help as, as support as, as well. Another question that did pop in was, have there been any studies on black ethnicities other, Afri other than African-Americans such as people with Caribbean background? So no, it hasn't delineated that far as far as I'm looking within the US. There might have been some studies by the International League Against Epilepsy when they were taking like a Cochrane review of all studies that mentioned um, race. Um, but as far as I understand, um, it hasn't delineated into a background of uh, Caribbean or uh, other, other ethnicities beyond just African-American. Or, of course, Hispanic um, and Islanders, but not when you talk about specific uh, regions. Great. Thank you. Wonderful questions, everyone. And thank you, uh, Tiffany, so much. Um, so we still have some more time, but it looks like as of right now, that is all the questions that have popped up in the chat box. Excuse me. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, looks like one question that popped up is I work with autistic children. Many who have self-injurious uh, head banging. Is there any data on these kids and the development of seizure disorder after years of this repeated behavior? They are another underserved demographic and I worry about CTE and seizure later in life. I've tried to change protocol after these behaviors in a calm room. 
So that I am unsure of. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, I haven't seen any studies, um, but I haven't looked at those with autism and uh, disability. So I haven't looked at, into that to give you a certain, um, for a certain if there are studies that look at um, autism and head banging and self-injurious beha behavior. Yeah, that's um, really unfortunate to hear. And we at the foundation are willing to help provide any, any trainings or education materials that, that we can provide. Um, you know, please uh, reach out to us uh, as well. Um, and another question is the stroke belt, what was the list of diseases that can cause it again? So the risk factors for stroke, not necessarily diseases, but they're risk factors that increase your likelihood of stroke. Um, and they're uh, basically risk factors that are, can be controlled. And those include hypertension or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, and then um, diabetes, type two diabetes. Great question. Um, and as of right now, that are all the questions. So somebody, it looks like we did have um, a couple, uh, another question pop in, which is um, how do doctors delineate juvenile seizures from seizures slash epilepsy that may have occurred from head injuries? Are they able to tell the difference? So it depends. Um, so if you're talking about juvenile, like JME, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Um, there are some epilepsies that uh, when you look at the EEG have a background activity that is consistent with a known seizure disorder um, versus if you're thinking that their seizures are from head banging, you could have a focal seizure disorder. Um, and so the EEG may help delineate that as well as the history. You know, if a patient didn't necessarily have a history of seizures at birth and then they started having seizures and, you know, you know this head banging injury, um, did it occur? Did they have a loss of consciousness um, and concussion with that? Cause that can increase your um, likelihood of having seizures. But we already know that autistic patients do have a tendency for having seizures. Thank you very much. And then there was, a, a, I founded a nonprofit called When the Trumpet Sounds, Can I Get Help with Pamphlets, et cetera. Um, I'm sure you can. I, I don't know what kind of information you exactly want. We get our own pamphlets from um, whether that's uh, drug companies or device companies, we usually ask them for the information so that patients can be able to contact uh, or read the information. And then uh, usually they have a patient advocate or a patient champion that has that type of device or on that type of medicine. And then they have a chance to call and they can contact those, people, those individuals. Yes, and if you're looking for any information on, you know, epilepsy and educational information, we can always be contacted as well, and, and we'll be happy to provide you that, um, whatever resources and information that we have. So really wonderful, great questions, everyone, and, and great answers. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, so I believe that's kind of all the questions we have right now. Um, so Dr. Fisher, thank you again so much for taking the time um, on the Saturday uh, this morning to speak to us and, and helping um, us, you know, look into more on the health disparities and um, 
that can be identified and more awareness in the epilepsy community. Um, and we do actually, so I just want to, again, thank you. Um, and there is one more question that well, I guess what we'll do since we do have some time. Um, what community groups could I reach out to and make people aware of what epilepsy is and make people aware of everything you have made mention of, including school students? I live near three schools in the school district. Um, so I would contact the school to ask them, you know, uh, is there something that you can, uh, do to make them more away, aware, um, like he said, contacting the Epilepsy Foundation, since they're already partnering with some of these schools to see what kind of, um, events that they're having, um, and then there may be even after school programs that can accommodate that, whether that's the why. Um, sometimes or different partnerships. Um, and now that we're living in a virtual world, that might be a little bit easier, so. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Yeah, reaching, reaching out to us to um, come, we're happy to come speak to schools, businesses, local community organizations to educate about, about epilepsy, um, you know, what to do for seizure first aid, the resources that we have available and helping people, um, you know, affected by epilepsy any way that we can with being advocates and helping raise awareness. So that's again, all, all the questions. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Fisher. We really appreciate you as our uh, keynote speaker for this year's conference. And, you know, we, again, just thank you and we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. All right, everyone. So that was our first speaker. Now we're gonna take a break until 10.15. Um, so you can get up, get some more coffee, breakfast, a snack, um, but we will be back at 10.15 for our next speaker.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, I would be happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anna Grafe. Dr. Grafe earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from Drexel University. She completed her pre-doctoral internship at Emory University School of Medicine and her postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the San Francisco VA Medical Center and the University of California, San Francisco. She is currently a clinical neuropsychologist in the Department of Neurology at Thomas Jefferson, where she also where she sees patients for neuropsychological evaluations and cognitive rehabilitation. Outside of work, she enjoys cooking, hiking, and exploring Philadelphia with her husband and dog. So please welcome uh, Anna Graft this morning. And Anna, I am going to hand it over to you at this time. Great. Thanks, Seamus. Uh, let me share my screen. Absolutely. All right, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so I am here today to talk to you a little bit about memory and cognition in the brain um, as pertains to epilepsy. Um, and here's a little roadmap for what I'm gonna be talking about this morning. Um, so first I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour through some basic neuroanatomy and sort of how we think about different cognitive abilities. And then I wanna talk a little bit about how cognition is affected by epilepsy and how we measure cognitive abilities. In particular, what is a neuropsychological evaluation um, and how could it be helpful for you as a patient? And then lastly, I wanna spend some time talking about strategies and techniques to improve cognition, because this is a question um, that we get all of the time in my practice. And I know that my epileptologist colleagues get this question as well. Um, so here are some common concerns that I hear from my patients. And we know from research that these are some of the most common concerns that people with epilepsy have about their cognition or thinking abilities. So when I hear these different concerns, I start to think about how this particular concern might be affecting someone in their daily life, what might be contributing to it, so what are the different factors that might be causing it, and where in the brain that problem might be originating. Um, so many people come to me with concerns about their memory, and then when we start talking about it, it becomes something a little bit more specific. So it could be something about um, forgetting things that people tell you or really a true memory problem. It could be something related to names or retrieving words, so maybe more of a language difficulty, or it could be um, forgetting your intention when you go from room to room, um, which could be more related to an attention problem. Um, so this is, when we talk about cognition, I think it's helpful to have a common vocabulary. And this is sort of, these are the different domains of cognitive functioning that I sort of, I use to map different cognitive concerns onto. So I generally think of cognitive functions as hierarchically organized, um, which means that there are some foundational skills that more complex skills are built on. So at the bottom here, we have attention and concentration. So that includes paying attention for short periods of time to things that you see or hear, sustaining that attention over time. So five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, especially while you're doing tasks that require a lot of concentration, like your taxes or your homework um, or watching a movie or switching your attention back and forth, otherwise known as multitasking. So for example, if you're cooking, um, Thanksgiving dinner and you've got multiple dishes going and all those things need to be done at the same time, um, you really have to pay attention to a lot of different things as, um, all at the same time. Next, we have visuospatial abilities. Um, so these are skills that you use, you might use to assemble things. So Legos um, or Ikea furniture, 
Um, it also includes judging spatial distances. So typically like we think of the skills that you need to parallel park a car. Um, it can also include more basic perceptual abilities. Um, so in your daily life, it might be, okay, so the instructions to assemble my complicated IKEA bookcase um, require two different types of screws. And I need to be able to look at the picture and match that to the screws in my hand. Um, we also have language abilities. So this includes your ability to express yourself through spoken or written language, as well as your ability to understand what other people are saying to you or understand what you're reading. And most, the most common concern I hear in this area is typically about remembering um, or learning new names um, or about um, what we call tip of the tongue phenomenon or word retrieval problems. So knowing that there's a specific word that you wanna say, but not being able to quite zero in on that word, um, although you could identify it if someone else filled in the blank for you. Next, we have learning and memory. Um, and this is farther up in the hierarchy because it's really dependent on your ability to pay attention, um, to use your language abilities or your visual spatial abilities to take that information in, um, and then to be able to store and retrieve that information when you need it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about memory and um, the upcoming slides. And then finally, we have executive functioning. So this is a really broad term that includes things like planning, organizing, problem solving, and inhibiting um, responses, so impulse control and things like that. So as promised, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, more about memory. Now, this is a very complex diagram, but I wanna highlight a few things. So um, we divide memory into two different categories. So there's declarative memory or explicit memory. And this just means it takes some effort to recall these memories. Um, and within this category, we have semantic memory, so memory for facts. And these are things that you can't necessarily recall where you might have learned them. They're sort of facts about the world. So what's the capital of Pennsylvania? What does a tiger look like? And then we have episodic memory. This is typically memory for events or things that happen to you. And that also includes things that you might need to um, deliberately recall later. So if you're studying for a test, um, learning and remembering that information is also considered episodic memory. And we also have this other category of memory, um, which I don't think most of us think about as memory so much called implicit memory. And so that just means that we don't really consciously have to recall it, it sort of comes to us. And um, I think the one category I would highlight under implicit memory is procedural memory. So this is memory for skills and habits. Um, so you, we've all you know, heard the phrase, like it's just like riding a bicycle. So you know that even if you haven't ridden a bicycle in a while, but you had learned how to ride one, that you could get on a bicycle and you would sort of just know how to do it, how to balance it without having to consciously say, okay, I put my hands here, my feet here, and then I do this. Um, and we also all have some other overlearned skills that are similar to that. So um, if you're a knitter or a crocheter, there are some aspects of that that will just come back to you if you haven't done it in many years, or if you learned how to play a certain um, sport well, that's also a type of procedural memory. We can also divide um, memory into different stages. And this is generally pertains to episodic memory, so that memory for events that have happened. Um, so first, um, we have to be able to pay attention. Attention is really the foundation of memory. Um, and if you're not paying attention to something, you're not going to be able to learn it and remember it later. Um, next, we have encoding, which is also learning. Um, so getting that information in. Um, next, we go to storage. Um, so storing that information. So here in our metaphor, we have a file. So encoding is getting that information into the file folder. Storage would be putting it into the filing cabinet um, for an, an indefinite period of time. Um, and it could be 30 seconds. It could be 10 years. Um, these are different. You know, this is long. Essentially, we're putting it into long term storage. And then finally, we have to be able to retrieve that memory when we need it. And so I think we've all had that experience of that feeling like you know something, but you can't quite specifically recall um, that specific information that you need. Um, 
So you need to be able to do this efficiently and um, within the time frame that you need it and not necessarily 15 or 20 minutes or several hours later. Importantly, disruption at any point in this process results in memory problems, but it can be really helpful to know where the breakdown is because there are different strategies that we might recommend that could help with your memory problem depending on uh, where along this continuum you have difficulties. So now I want to talk a little bit about neuroanatomy, and this is a really busy slide. Um, so if you take one thing away from this, I want you to learn that um, there are different areas of the brain that have different jobs. Um, so this is a view of the brain where we have the blue is the front of your head and the red is the back of your head. So blue on the left and red on the right. Um, and that we've highlighted the different lobes of the brain and they all have generally have different jobs. Um, so the frontal lobe um, is involved in motor control and planning. It's also involved in problem solving and decision making, so those higher order cognitive functions. It's very important for attention. Um, and there's also an area called Broca's area, sort of at the bottom part of the frontal lobe, um, that's involved in speech production and expressive language. Um, next, we have the temporal lobe, um, which is involved in memory and semantic knowledge or semantic memory. So remember, that's that memory for facts. Um, processing auditory information, comprehending written and spoken language, as well as some face and emotion processing. The yellow lobe, um, sort of at the top towards the right side, is the parietal lobe, and that includes the somatosensory strip, which is involved in touch sensation. It's also really important for visual spatial skills, so spatial planning and where is your body in space. Um, in relation to other objects. And then finally, towards the back, we have a, the red area is the occipital lobe. Um, and that's the area of the brain that receives, the first area of the brain that receives visual information from your eyes. And so therefore it's really involved in interpreting that information and distributing it to other areas of the brain so that that information can be used. I wanna transition into talking a little bit about epilepsy and cognition. Um, so we know that concerns about memory and other cognitive abilities are common among people with epilepsy and the estimates have really varied across studies, um, but we think maybe up to about 70% of people with epilepsy have some concern about their cognition. And we also know that people's concerns about their memory are not always correlated with our formal assessments of memory. Um, and this finding is true across patients with many different neurological diagnoses, not just epilepsy. Uh, our research has suggested some potential reasons for this. So some studies have found that subjective um, concerns about cognition are related to or correlated with symptoms of depression or other mood concerns. Um, there's also some thinking that these concerns might reflect some subtle cognitive changes that we can't detect on our formal testing. And then in some instances, um, people who report the least number of concerns about their memory may actually have be at the highest risk for having memory problems. So in some sense, um, their memory problem prevents them from truly understanding that they have a memory problem. There are a few different um, categories of factors um, that can affect cognition and behavior in people with epilepsy. I like to divide them up this way. Um, so first we have factors that are related to seizures or epilepsy itself. And then second, we have factors related to the treatment of epilepsy. And then finally, we have non-seizure related factors. And these factors are not necessarily specific to people with epilepsy, um, but can apply to all different types of people. Um, so this diagram explains in a bit more detail about the seizure and treatment related factors that can affect cognitive functioning in people with epilepsy. So to orient you in neuroanatomical terms, this is a coronal view of the brain. Um, so if you started from the front of your head and you took slices all the way to the back of your head like a loaf of bread, this slice would be somewhere in the middle, maybe around or just in front of where your ears are. So it would be going from ear to ear. 
Um, so in this diagram on the left side, we have structural factors that can contribute to cognitive difficulties. And these are largely irreversible. Um, so first we have potentially progressive lesions, such as some types of brain tumors. Next, we have stationary lesions, which include um, scars from prior traumatic brain injuries or strokes. And then finally, we have resection as part of, of part of the brain um, that was done through epilepsy surgery to treat refractory seizures. In the center here, we have clinical factors related to epilepsy. And this includes how long you've had epilepsy, the location of your seizure focus, if you have focal epilepsy. And so that's important because remember different parts of the brain have different functions. Um, so the location of your seizure focus could be related to the types of cognitive difficulties that you may have, the types of seizures that you have, and if you've had one or more episodes of status epilepticus. And finally, on the right, we have functional factors, and these are largely reversible or modifiable. The first one is anti-seizure medications, particularly the older medications like phenobarbital, um, and these can negatively affect cognition. Um, next, psychiatric comorbidities like depression and anxiety um, can cause or exacerbate cognitive difficulties. Next, we have the seizures themselves, particularly when they're frequent and not well controlled by medication. And then finally, many people with epilepsy have what we call interictal epileptic discharges, which are pathological signs that we can see in between seizures on an EEG. And just like seizures, these can be treated with anti-seizure medications. Um, now, next we have other factors um, that can affect cognition in people with epilepsy. So as I mentioned on the prior slide, I think mood is a big one. So we know that depression and anxiety um, can interfere with memory, attention, and information processing. And again, this isn't specific to people with epilepsy. This pertains to all of us. Um, and then outside of a diagnosed um, psychological disorder, we also know that the day-to-day -day stress that we all may experience can affect cognition, and that includes both, both positive and negative stress. So by positive stress, I mean things like having a baby or getting married. Negative stress um, could mean the loss of a loved one um, or financial difficulties or difficulties at your job. Sleep can definitely affect memory through two different mechanisms. So first, we have a growing body of research that sleep is really important for memory consolidation. Consolidation is another word for storage, that storage stage of memory. Um, and so there's some research showing that the hippocampus, which is an important structure in the temporal lobe, um, and some related structures um, are actively consolidating memories during sleep. Finally, um, under sleep, we have daytime alertness and attention. So anyone who, who's pulled an all-nighter or had a newborn can attest that their um, lack of nighttime sleep definitely can affect how alert they are and how attentive they are during the day. And remember when we were talking about memory that attention is the foundation of memory. So if you're not uh, fully attending to things, that will affect your memory for those things later on. Next, pain can absolutely affect um, memory and other cognitive functions, um, and some pain medications themselves um, can also have some negative effects on cognitive abilities. And then finally, medical comorbidities. Um, so we think about things like cardiac disease, liver and kidney disease, um, diabetes, particularly when it's poorly controlled, and sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea. Um, particularly when they're untreated. Now I wanna talk a little bit about how we formally evaluate cognitive concerns. So a neuropsychological evaluation is the gold standard for evaluating cognitive functions. Um, and this type of evaluation is conducted by a clinical neuropsychologist, which is a licensed psychologist with expertise in how brain behavior and, sorry, how behavior and skills are related to brain structures and systems. And typically it's requested 
to help you, your doctors, or other professionals understand how the different areas and systems of your brain are working. And it usually consists of a clinical interview with the neuropsychologist, um, and it can be very helpful to have a family member there to provide some additional information about cognitive concerns and other things that may be going on. Next, there will be formal testing of cognitive skills where, you're do, where you'll do a variety of tasks um, that directly assess those different cognitive functions that I talked about um, earlier in my presentation. You'll complete questionnaires about mood, personality, quality of life, um, and sometimes other concerns. And following all of this, um, which is usually done in over the course of one to two days, um, we will um, collate everything into a report um, that includes our summary and impressions and some recommendations. And then we would have a feedback with you um, and any of your family members that you would like to invite um, to review the results and recommendations and really transition from the assessment um, piece to intervention. So how are we going to address these different concerns that you have or your doctors have? The International League Against Epilepsy recently came out with some guidelines outlining several situations in which a neuropsychological evaluation should be considered. Um, and there's generally four um, different categories. So the first is at epilepsy onset, and they recommend that there be some type of cognitive and behavioral screening that will give a baseline and identify people who might need more extensive testing or psychological treatment. And they had a specific concern about older adults with a new epilepsy diagnosis and recommended more strongly that those individuals have a baseline evaluation. They also recommend an evaluation when there's a concern for focal cognitive dysfunction. So this means a concern that a specific part of your brain um, and its related cognitive functions um, may not be working quite as well as it has in the past. And this could be due to your concern that you have about your cognition, or it could be related to some findings on neuroimaging or on EEG. Um, and often it's a combination of, of multiple things that can lead to that type of referral. Next, when there's a question of neurodevelopmental delay um, or behavioral or learning difficulties, um, and this particularly is relevant to kids um, or cognitive decline, and that concern would be more related to adults or older adults. And then finally, when evaluating for the effects of the disorder and its treatment, and the number one thing that falls under this category is um, a neuropsychological evaluation as part of the pre-surgical workup when a patient is considering um, neurosurgical treatment for their epilepsy. So I'm gonna spend the remainder of my present talk, presentation talking about different strategies to address cognitive concerns. So I think the number one thing to, rec to remember is that we all have occasional memory slips. And so a few memory slips now and again is very normal. Our memories are not perfect um, and that's okay. When, I, when you have a chronic illness like epilepsy, um, I think it can also feel like there are a lot of things that are out of your control. Um, and that can be very worrying and anxiety inducing. Um, so it's nice to focus on things that are in your control that can lead to some true noticeable improvements. So there are many factors that affect your memory that are in your control. Um, so the first thing I think about is making sure that seizures are optimally controlled. And again, you may not have control yourself over that, but what you can control is making sure that you're communicating with your doctors um, about medications, including taking your medications as prescribed and letting them know if there are any barriers to taking medications as prescribed, like financial barriers, cognitive barriers like forgetting, um, and working with them to address those concerns. Next, treating depression and anxiety, um, and that could include more evaluation or um, looking for a referral for psychotherapy or finding a psychiatrist. Um, reducing stress, and this is something that I recommend 
to, I think, practically everyone that I see because we all experience stress in our daily life. Um, and this can include relaxation strategies, um, meditation, including mindfulness meditation. And at the end of the, my presentation, I have a resources slide that lists some apps and programs that can be helpful um, for starting a meditation practice or incorporating some relaxation strategies into your daily life. Um, next, improving sleep. So there are a number of what we call sleep hygiene practices, so sort of like best, best practices for sleep um, that can um, help us all improve the quality and quantity of our sleep. Um, and this includes some of the hard things that maybe we're all occasionally, <laughs> we all occasionally do, like not having screens just before bedtime or not using your phone when you're in bed or watching TV when you're in bed. Um, and um, sleeping in a cold, dark room and not doing other things um, like playing on your phone, for example, while you're in bed. Um, but it could also include a formal sleep study or referral to a sleep clinic if there are concerns for a sleep disorder like sleep apnea. Um, exercise is extremely helpful um, for mood as well as for cardiovascular health, which can indirectly affect brain health. Um, limiting alcohol intake. So um, there's two concerns with alcohol. First is that um, consuming alcohol regularly in excess of the um, CDC recommendations um, has been strongly related to cognitive dysfunction. And next, alcohol can lower your seizure threshold. Um, and so it's really important to make sure that you're moderating your alcohol intake and that you're discussing any concerns you have with your doctor about that. Um, staying socially engaged and mentally engaged, cognitively engaged can be extremely helpful. Um, and then finally, there are a number of compensatory strategies or rehabilit rehabilitation strategies that can be really helpful for coping with memory problems in your day-to-day -day life. So I want to talk a little bit more in detail about compensatory strategies for memory. So by compensatory strategies, I mean we're not necessarily fixing your memory problem, we're developing strategies to help you cope with a memory problem and decrease its effect, decrease the hassle of the memory problem in your day-to-day -day life. And I think about these strategies in two different buckets. So the first bucket is external memory strategies. And by external, I mean outside of your brain. These are tools that you use um, to supplement your memory. And the number one thing that I always recommend to all of my patients is keeping some sort of calendar or planner for appointments, to-do lists, things that you just general things that you need to remember, and using that as a central resource and getting in the habit of checking it multiple times a day. So not keeping a million post-it notes that could be lost or you could have difficulty deciphering out of context or having multiple notebooks, but really having one central place um, where you record everything and creating a habit um, of looking at it regularly, preferably a couple times a day. Um, that can also be electronic or it can be paper. It's really whatever you're gonna use in your daily life. Um, I also recommend um, if you're misplacing things, a strategy, strategies like automatic places. So having one place where you put those important things like phone, keys, wallet um, when you get home and also having places where you keep those things when you leave your home as well. And there are also so many apps out there um, that can be really helpful. So there's apps for tracking seizures, there's calendar apps, there are alarms that you can use to, um, to remember when to take medications. Um, and so working on which apps and which electronic strategies or um, tools work for you best um, can be really helpful. The other category we have is internal memory strategies. So these are mental tips or tricks that you can use to help your memory be more e efficient. So one category of this is mnemonics um, and also songs and rhymes. 
And these are the things that I think um, I probably used the most when I was in like elementary school. So there are just some acronyms, for example, that I still remember today to provide an example, homes for the Great, um, for the Great Lakes. So Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie and Superior. When did I learn that? I'm not sure, but it's clearly stuck. So making use, you can even make up your own acronyms. Um, and then also songs or rhymes. So these sorts of things use a different part of our brain than regular day-to-day -day speech and language. Um, and so in some ways they can be a really great workaround if you're having um, some language difficulties. They also are just stickier um, in terms of our memory. They tend to stay in our memory better. And so I'm sure we all have songs that we're not sure how we learned them, but when they come on the radio, just with that cue, you know every single word. Um, and so you can harness, um, if you're musically inclined, you can harness that our brain's tendency to like, like songs and rhythm and rhyme um, to supplement your memory. So finally, we have a, um, a few strategies that are related to really harnessing visual memory. Um, and I've had these strategies really click for some folks that I've worked with. Um, and this, this, um, these strategies bank on this tendency of our brain to really be able to store a lot of information and emotion in images. So we've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and I think that as far as our brains are concerned, this is really true. We have this amazing ability to put all of this information into a single picture. So I just grabbed a few iconic images, um, which I think, you know, some of these individual images might have much more meaning and connotation than just simply a man standing on the moon with an American flag behind him, for example. Um, so we can really use visualization techniques to store more information. And this is not something specific to um, people with epilepsy or a strategy that's specific to people with epilepsy. This is the same strategy that memory champions use when they are remembering thousands of digits of pi um, or they're remembering the um, order of cards in a deck of cards. Um, so these are just inherent ways that our brains work um, and optimizing those strategies. You don't have to have a good memory to be able to use these strategies. Um, you just have to know how to use it. So um, one example that I'd like to start off with, and I'll give you another one too, is remembering my name. So my name is Anna Grafe, and um, I'm gonna teach you how to remember it. So the first thing I'm gonna say is my first name rhymes with banana. So I want you to picture a banana. And then my last name, Grafe, rhymes with safe. So I want you to picture a safe. And I'm a neuropsychologist, so you're gonna make that safe shaped like a brain. However, you know, whatever you think of as a brain, I want you to imagine it. And that's a, it's a brain and it's a safe. So it's got a dial on the side and that banana, the Anna banana is gonna try to crack the safe. So I want you to picture a banana concentrating really hard. Maybe it has a stethoscope, like one of those old, you know, old timey movies, working on that dial, trying to crack the brain safe. Okay, so when you hear my name, I want you to think of that banana cracking the safe, Anna Grafe. And that's a strategy that you can use with some additional effort with um, names that you might have a challenge with. So creating a rhyme or some sort of other way to translate the name into an image, um, and then making that image funny or absurd. Um, because we know that out of the ordinary things are easier to remember than the ordinary day-to-day -day things. Okay, I wanna talk you through another strategy. There's a few different names for this one. Um, and so this is called the memory palace. You can also call it a memory walk um, or method of loci is the other um, term that's sometimes used. And so for this, um, you need to create your own memory palace. Um, and you can even have multiple memory palaces if you'd like. I'd start with a really simple one like your house. And so you need to imagine yourself walking through this familiar place. 
Um, and it's very helpful for remembering lists of things like grocery lists or errands that you need to do or related concepts. Um, so when I was studying for my boards exam, I used this to remember the different types of memory systems and the neuroanatomy of those systems. Um, so for this example, I need to go shopping and I've got to get bananas, Reese's peanut butter cups for Halloween um, and milk. And so this is my apartment here. And I'm going to imagine myself, um, and I'm not, if you can see my cursor, um, I'm going to imagine myself walking in through this, going up the stairs, walking in through the door. And the first thing that I see is the dining room table. So I'm going to put those bananas on the dining room table. And conveniently, there are six chairs. So I'm going to remember I need to get a bunch of bananas. Maybe I need to get six bananas. Next. I'm going to put these Reese's peanut butter cups um, on the coffee table in the living room. So I'm going to imagine myself. Now I've put the bananas on the table and I'm walking into the living room area and I'm putting the peanut butter cups on the coffee table. And then finally, I'm going to put the milk in the kitchen and the milk's going in the kitchen because I like to have milk in my coffee. Um, so I'm actually going to put that milk right next to the coffee maker. Um, so now if I want to remember um, this list of things, um, I'm going to imagine myself walking into the door, seeing the bananas on the dining room table, the peanut butter cups on the coffee table, and then walking into the kitchen and seeing the milk next to the coffee maker. Now I can make this, I can go the extra mile and make this funny or absurd. Um, so, for example, I might imagine the bananas dancing on top of the dining room table and I'm telling the bananas, bananas, get in your seats, and they all sit down in a chair. The Reese's peanut butter cups, um, they're watching a scary movie, and you know how they have that crinkly package, that crinkly plastic around them? They're so scared that their little crinkly package is shaking. Um, and then next, I'm going to go into the kitchen. And um, if I'm making myself on the weekends, like a Saturday morning, a fancy coffee, I might froth my milk. So I'm gonna imagine that milk frothing up and it's exploding all over the kitchen and like, what a mess. And now I have to clean it up. So now I've taken that strategy and I've, I've elaborated on it and I've made it even more memorable um, because I've added some extra um, things to it. So, I think the next question would be, how do you then ha have a guide to teach you through using some of these strategies and really customizing them to your daily life? Um, because this is, this is a lot of information and new strategies to take in if you wanna use these things. Um, so one um, intervention that's been developed is called Hobscotch and it's offered here through the Epilepsy, Epilepsy Foundation. And it stands for Home-Based Self-Management and Cognitive Training Changes Lives. It's a self-management program designed to help people with epilepsy find ways to manage and cope with their memory problems. And by self-management, we mean that you're working collaboratively together with a memory coach to learn strategies that you can go out and implement in your day-to-day -day life. And they'll help you cope with the effects of epilepsy um, in your day-to-day -day life better. It involves eight sessions with a memory coach and um, typically those are all done remotely, um, although the first and last session may be done um, in person, depending on um, safety precautions and other things like that. Um, and then the middle six sessions can be done either through uh, telemed telemedicine or um, video conferencing software like Zoom or over the phone. Um, and through this, you can learn a little bit more about how epilepsy and seizures affect memory you can learn skills to compensate for memory problems in day-to-day -day life. And you also will learn some ways to reduce stress, um, some very specific strategies to improve your memory. And hopefully this will increase your general quality of life on the day-to-day. -day. So just to conclude, we've talked a little bit about cognitive domains and neuroanatomy. Um, we've discussed about uh, what is a neuropsychological, neuropsychological evaluation um, and what can it um, give more information about? We've talked a little bit about um, 
concerns related to subjective um, memory problems and some of the different factors that can contribute to cognitive dysfunction in epilepsy. Uh, and we've also talked about the different modifiable or treatable contributors to cognitive difficulties and discussed some strategies to cope with those. Um, so I wanna also direct you to some resources. So first, if you're interested in hopscotch, you can reach out to Seamus. Um, there's a fabulous presentation by the director of the Hopscotch Institute um, which is um, up in New Hampshire at Dartmouth um, that includes some of the information I've actually covered in my presentation and much more in-depth information about um, hopscotch and they have their own website as well. There are a few books that I really like. So um, if you're interested in more memory strategies, Moonwalking with Einstein is a great book. Um, and if you're interested in just stories about people who have epilepsy and other um, neurological disorders. Oliver Sacks is just amazing, and um, he's written a couple of books that have some stories about people with epilepsy. And then finally, if you're interested in um, learning more about mindfulness, Headspace and Calm are the two apps that I like. Um, and then there's also, um, I think it's an eight or 10 week course um, called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. Um, and this is where you, together with a group of people, um, you meet once a week to learn about mindfulness meditation and how it can reduce stress. Um, and then you develop a daily medication, uh, meditation practice. Um, I think this is being offered virtually now due to the band pandemic, um, but there are courses at Jefferson and Penn um, that you can register for. And I think before committing, there is a tuition fee, but before committing, they offer free sessions so that you can get a bit of a taste um, of what the full um, MBSR course would be like. So here are my references. Um, and I'm gonna conclude my talk and, and we'll turn it over to questions. Perfect, thank you so much, Anna, for that wonderful presentation. Um, if anyone does have any questions, uh, please go ahead and submit them in the chat box. And it looks like we did actually have a couple questions pop up already. Um, the first one was, what about increased difficulty spelling basic words that you were able to spell before? Yeah, um, so there are a few different things that can contribute to that. Um, first, there is there are specific areas of the brain that are involved in spelling, um, but I would also want to talk a little bit more about if there are certain situations where that happens or certain types of words, um, because definitely things like um, attention problems or anxiety um, can contribute to spelling problems. Um, Thank you very much. And the sure. next question was, um, how does insular seizures affect memory? That's a really great question. Um, and I don't have a simple answer for it. So um, the insula is um, a structure in the temporal lobe, um, which is connected to a lot of different other areas of the brain. So we talked about how each of the different lobes of the brain have different jobs, um, but we, we didn't talk much about how um, those areas are all connected, you know, under inside our brains, it's basically a highway connecting different cortical or outside regions of the brain to each other. So the insula has a lot of different connections. Um, and so it really depends on, and it's a, it's a, you know, deceptively large structure. So it sort of depends on where your seizures are coming from in the insula. Um, and sometimes we can see memory problems, um, with people who have insular seizures or language difficulties. Um, and that's something that definitely a neuropsychological evaluation could give a little bit more information about. Okay, great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that helps answer a lot of my questions too. Um, <laughs> so it looks like a couple more questions came in. And the next one is, is there a central resource slash website to do an online search for local neuropsychologists. I have a client with a TBI who relocated from another state and she would like to see a neuropsychologist. Yes. So um, there are a few local resources I can recommend. 
Um, the national resource that I would recommend is, um, is a board certification website. Um, so the American Academy of Professional Psychology, um, or ABIP, what does it stand for? Board Certification in Professional Psychology, um, maintains a directory of board certified clinical neuropsychologists. Um, so I would Google board certified clinical neuropsychologists, um, and I think you'll get that directory. Um, you know, our practice at Jefferson also um, could absolutely see individuals with TBI. Um, and then there are some local places that specialize in TBI. So um, Brancroft Neuro Rehab um, and um, Moss Rehab, um, both specialize in, in um, working with individuals with TBI. Okay, great. Awesome. And here at the foundation as well, we also do have a list with um, um, for different psychologists and neuropsychologists as well, too. Um, so we're always happy to, to share that with anyone that's interested. Um, the next question is, Anna, it seems that our son's memory has been affected by the seizure medication he takes. Is this common? Yeah, um, so the, the cognitive side effects of anti-seizure medications really vary. Um, so there are some medications that we worry about a little bit more. So I mentioned some of the older medications like you know, Barbitol and Phenotoin um, are, have a greater risk of cognitive interference. And then um, topiramate and zanisamide among the newer medications um, may have more um, cognitive side effects, but every individual is different. Um, and sometimes it can be medication effects that can affect cognition. So I would definitely bring this up with your son's neurologist and just talk through the different medications um, that they're on. I think sometimes there's a bit of a um, sort of cost benefit analysis because some medications might control seizures, um, but have challenging side effects. And that's something that really has to be personalized. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, the next question is for the virtual mindfulness. Uh, where, I guess, is the site that, that could, people could look up the uh, course? Mm -hmm. um, why don't I, uh, with these, these, why don't I put that in the chat? Um, maybe yeah, you can, my talk, would that be helpful? Yeah, you can absolutely put it in the chat for people okay. to um, copy and paste. And if you also would like to send it to me, and Perfect. we'd be happy to send it out to everyone who is on today's conference. Okay, great. I think that that would be the best way to do that. And I can do that for that um, directory of neuropsychologists as well for that uh, part. Thank, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I'm seeing one about the effect of a small corpus callosum on neuropsych testing. Um, yeah, so I think that you're asking about a condition called agenesis or a partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Um, and so on neuropsychological testing, there are a variety of things that can be associated with that and everyone is a bit different. Um, so sometimes we see that individuals um, with smaller corpus callosums have um, slower, it takes them longer to do things, so slower processing speed, and they can have some attention problems and executive functioning difficulties. Um, and they can also have some challenges um, interpersonally, so some difficulty with understanding and reading other people's emotions um, and using that information in social situations. Great. And then the next question looks like, should I be concerned with if I am reminded of the same thing more than once in a matter of five minutes? Is there something I should say or make the people aware of? that I heard the question or statement and I don't need to be reminded so much. Like when I go, to, like when I go to work or if they're like, I guess out in a social situation they're trying to ask. Yeah, um, I think, I think so based on the information in this question, you know, if you are reminded for, of something, you know, a couple times in the matter of a short period of time, sometimes that's a difficulty with attention. Um, so some strategies that can be helpful um, for that are, you know, paraphrasing or summarizing back that information to the person. And that can be helpful first because it really clarifies to make sure that you understood the information 
And also it really focuses your attention. So, so often, you know, we're all doing multiple things at once and, you know, you could be on your phone and someone says something to you, you might not fully attend to that. So by paraphrasing or repeating something back to someone, that can be a good way to make sure that your attention is really focused on what you heard. So it's just one thing that that question made me think of. Well, that's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like another question is, are there studies looking at the impact on memory um, after post-surgical interventions? Um, let's see. So there are definitely some studies looking at the effects of um, surgery on cognitive functions. Um, those really, you know, the effects of surgery on cognitive functions really depend on so many different factors, like where the surgery is and the type of epilepsy and, um, and you know, someone's baseline functioning. Um, there aren't any studies specifically that have looked um, at, um, like, interventions after surgery to help with cognition. There's really actually a very limited number of studies on rehabilitation, cognitive rehabilitation after epilepsy, or cognitive rehabilitation and epilepsy in general. Um, so I think that there's a vast need for a little bit more research on things that can help people who have had brain surgery. Hmm. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it looks like Karen makes a good point, uh, you know, keeping an organized clutter-free sp clutter space can be incredibly helpful for memory. Um, you know, a place where everything's organized and a spot for everything. Um, you're absolutely right, Karen. That's a, being organized can be very helpful. Totally agree. Uh, looks like our next question for you, Anne, is, is there some vitamin and foods that can help with memory problems? I assume that certain seizure meds take away certain vitamins and cause memory issues too. Yeah. Um, so this is a really good question to bring up with your epileptologist. Um, so there are some vitamins with all people that we think of as being important for cognition. So um, I think in particular, vitamin B12 um, is one that's important for cognitive functioning. Um, and you can get a blood test for that to see if that's low. Um, it's not typically affected by our seizure medications, um, but it, it can be something that can be low if you don't have a lot of B12 in your diet. So sometimes we see that with vegetarians. Um, vitamin D is another one to keep track of as well. Um, and um, as far as foods, um, there aren't any specific foods that I recommend, but um, for all people, I recommend a Mediterranean diet. That's the one that we have the best evidence for. And that's really not specific to people with epilepsy. That's really a recommendation um, because the Mediterranean diet is good for cardiovascular health. Um, and um, in turn, it's good for the, you know, cerebrovascular or, you know, um, blood vessels in your brain. Um, I know that there are some, absolutely some special diets for people with epilepsy that you, you know, can be helpful for, not for cognition, but for controlling seizures. Perfect. Okay, Thank great. You. And then Tara had a question about insular seizures. So yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get those, uh, we'll, we'll find some educational materials for you, Tara, and, and send those to you. Okay. So it looks like uh, those are all the questions we have. Um, so again, I want to say thank you so much, Anna, for uh, taking the time and presenting on memory and cognition to the community today. I, it was an excellent talk, and I learned a lot, so we, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really been my pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you so much and enjoy your weekend and have a happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. So we are going to take another little 10 minute break and we are going to come back at 11.15 for our, our next speaker, which will be Dr. Armina Omali.
Welcome back, everyone. And we are going to get started and introduce our next speaker for the day. Please welcome Dr. Armina O'Malley. Uh, Dr. O'Malley is an epileptologist and physician scientist at GlaxoSmithKline. She has a special interest in the processes in the brain underlying the development of epilepsy and post-traumatic epilepsy. She received an MD, PhD from the Medical University of South Carolina, where she researched the changes in synaptic plasticity associated with drug addiction. She went on to complete internal medicine and neurology residency training at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, during which she developed a passion for caring for patients with epilepsy. She was awarded an NIH R25 fellowship to begin conducting research on the development of epilepsy through models of post-traumatic epilepsy during her residency. After residency, she completed epilepsy fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, where she stayed on staff caring for patients and conducting research on epileptogenesis before transitioning to a position at GSK this summer to help develop the next generation of medications for patients with neurological disease. So please welcome Armina. Thanks, Seamus. Can you see my, my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, give everyone some updates as far as some of the clinical trials and the research that's going on. By no means is this an exhaustive list of what's going on. It's just some of the things that I found really interesting that are new most of the findings that I'm going to talk about even have come up within the last month or so. Right. So a disclosure, which Seamus already mentioned, I'm a discovery medicine physician at GlaxoSmithKline. However, I'm not talking about any of the medications or development that's going on in GlaxoSmithKline, and I don't have any, um, I don't have any interest in any of the um, trials that I'll be talking about today. So just to kind of give you an idea as what I'm going to talk about is just kind of, we're going to first kind of just start with talking about, you know, what are clinical trials, talk about the different types. I know with the current situation, um, you know, with what's going on in the news right now, I think that people are a little more savvy as far as clinical trials, but I will just kind of define the different types and why clinical trials are important. And then we'll go into some of the interesting new epilepsy therapies in the pipeline. And then after that, we'll talk about how, how anyone can get involved if they'd like to. So for this audience, I'm pretty sure that everyone is very familiar with the fact that over 54 million people worldwide suffer with epilepsy and at least 3 million patients in the US alone. And one of the issues is that despite having decades of drug development and many anti-seizure medications, there's still one in three epilepsy patients that still continue to have uncontrolled seizures. And as we know, that affects you know, their independence, it affects um, the chances of mortality, multiple things that it affects. Um, so when someone comes into the office, and they're having uncontrolled seizures, and they're already on a medication, first steps are usually, okay, we'll see how we can optimize the medication that they're on. And then if that doesn't work, then we look at other medications that work in a different way, right? So using a different mechanism of action, working on a different receptor maybe. And then depending on their profile, maybe they're also a candidate for surgical intervention. Um, so once someone has gone through a certain number of medications, there's a lower percentage chance that the next medication will help 
if they have, you know, a type of epilepsy that could be surgically intervened upon. So some of the surgical interventions would be, you know, like a resection where they take a little part of the brain out that's the part that's causing trouble, or they laser that part out with a laser ablation, or sometimes it can be um, like a RNS, so repetitive nerve simulator, or VNS, vagal nerve simulator, or DVS, <laughs> deep brain simulator. Um, so there are a lot of different options surgically, but not everyone is actually a candidate for surgical intervention. And then there are some people who undergo surgical intervention and still continue to have trouble. So one of the things that we go to next is we try and get these patients access to the newest therapy. Um, and these are the ones that are happening in clinical trials. So just very basically, what is a clinical trial? So clinical trials are research studies where we're looking at um, evaluating the safety of new medications and how well they work for the efficacy of these medications. But it can also be, so we talk about medications a lot, but it could be treatment. Um, it could be ways of, you know, ways of, you know, doing a certain procedure. It could also be devices. Um, so one of the things that's also great about these studies is that it can help identify which patients would benefit the most. So then your epilepsy specialist can then say, okay, well, knowing what we know from these studies, you'd probably be a better fit for this medication versus this medication or this procedure versus this procedure. Clinical trials also um, can help us to compare the new medications that are coming on with some of the medications that are already established. And that's helpful to know whether is this really you know, worth the risk of bringing on this new medication. So when we talk about clinical trials, typically we break them into two groups. So there's observational trials and there's interventional trials. So observational trials are the trials where the researchers collect data um, from, you know, from the person or patient just as they go along their regular life. Um, and there aren't any interventions in that case. So they don't give you like a pill to take or anything like that. You just do everything that you would normally do and they look at different outcomes. Then there's also interventional studies where the researchers collect data. Typically they'll collect for a period of time before giving a study, um, a study intervention. And that's just to kind of know what you're like on a daily basis. And then they'll give, you know, the study therapy or whatnot, or they will give a placebo, which is a control treatment, which is basically like you could receive a pill, for instance, but the pill doesn't have any active drug in it. And so then, and then they look at the, the difference between those groups. Within interventional studies, you also have open label studies. That's where um, the subject or the, the patient knows what they're taking, like what, whether they're taking the study drug or the placebo control. And the researcher also knows, right? And then there's also these types of studies that you've probably heard of called, you know, like blinded studies or double blinded studies. Um, so for double blinded studies, the patient doesn't know whether they got the active drug or the control and the researcher doesn't either. And the reason why these are really helpful is because it really helps to cut down on biases um, and really helps us to get a good idea as to what's happening when we look at the data later on. So there are different phases of clinical trials. Most of the time we're talking about the three major phases because those are the ones that happen before the drug is approved. Um, but then there's also a phase four. So phase one studies just look at the safety of the treatment and it, it identifies what are safe doses to give people. Um, and then for phase two, you're still looking at some safety, but you're also looking at early signs of how effective the treatment is for people. And in this case, people with epilepsy. Phase Three is where you're actually doing kind of a comparison between, you know, whether the new treatment, how it kind of stacks up with what is already on the market. 
And then phase four is kind of, this is after the drug or the treatment has been approved. And they kind of term them as real world trials in that the fact that um, these are kind of like longer studies many times, they look at long-term risk, they look at long-term benefits of the medications that you can't really get within that short period that you're looking at efficacy in like say a phase two or phase three study. So why participate in a clinical trial? So one, um, you know, possible access to new experimental therapies, and this is under close monitoring. However, it is important to note that one, you don't know whether, you know, you're going to be in the active group or if you're going to be in, you know, the placebo group. And then, you know, the purpose of the study is to know whether, you know, this will be better, worse, or the same as the medications that are already on the market. So that's also something to kind of consider. Um, there's also another reason to participate is just the opportunity to be part of this development of new treatments for yourself and for future patients. Um, a lot of the studies, especially some of the observational studies, are important for helping researchers and specialists better understand the causes and the effects of epilepsy and really how it affects everyday life. This allows you know, us to advocate for better resources. This allows us to you know, develop better medications, you know, make sure that we're focusing on the things that matter to the patient. Um, additionally, you know, possible early access to a study drug if, it's, if it works. And then the other thing is you, know, you have access to specialists that are very knowledgeable and you know, they're monitoring you the whole time that you're in the study. So that was just a whirlwind, very brief tour of you know, clinical trials just before we get into this, just so then you have kind of an idea of, of what we're talking about here. So when we think about epilepsy, um, there are multiple trials going on, as you can see, like a total of, you know, over a thousand total trials, but ongoing trials, there are 96 trials going on. And if you look down in this section, you'll notice that they're really spread pretty almost evenly um, among phase one, which is the safety, phase two is safety and efficacy. And then phase three, comparing to you know, what we already have, and then also real world studies, which is the phase four. So I'm only gonna talk about just a few subsets. These are just some, um, some studies that I found really interesting that have popped up over the last couple of months. Um, by no way am I endorsing any of the medications, but just things that are, I think are interesting that I'll, I'll actually be watching to see what happens. So one of the first ones um, that I wanna talk about is Zen 1101, um, which is a small molecule that's being developed by Xenon um, as a small molecule anti-epileptic drug. And the mechanism of action is targeting the KV7 potassium channel. Um, so for anyone who's kind of has a lot of history with some of the older medications. This is very interesting because um, there was an older drug, um, named Potiga, that also targeted this potassium channel and ultimately was removed from the market. Um, one of the you know, characteristic side effects associated with that medication was that there was hyperpigmentation of people's skin, almost like a bluish color. Um, so that was definitely one of the reasons of, you know, other reasons that it was removed from the market. But Xenon has taken um, this same target, targeting um, approach, um, but has kind of changed things a bit. So they don't have some of the same side effects. So they enrolled 323 patients and randomized them. So kind of just randomly put them into either a high dose group, a middle dose group, a low dose group or placebo. And um, there was a press release actually just this month that showed that there were positive results in their phase 2B test in all three doses. Now, what they found was that when they looked at, um, when they looked at the change in the seizure frequency, so how often people were having seizures 
compared to, you know, when they were on the drug compared to the period of time beforehand, um, which we call the baseline. The people that were on the low dose had a 33% reduction in their seizures. And then the middle dose had 46% reduction. And then the high dose had a 52% reduction compared to those patients that were receiving the placebo, which is a control, who had an 18%. They also noted responder rates, which when we talk about responder rates, we're talking about the percent of patients that, um, that have at least a 50% improvement in their seizure frequency. And the responder rate for the higher dose was 54.5%, which is a, a good modest um, improvement. Um, and then it was 43 and 28% respectively for middle and low doses. Importantly, some of the um, main focuses were really whether Zen 1101 had good safety and tolerability. And it seems like it did from, you know, at least their press release, because remember we received all this information from the company. Um, they noted that two, only like they had two patients that experienced urinary retention or trouble urinating um, and had to be moved to lower doses, but otherwise they didn't have um, a lot of problems of tolerability and there were no signs of hyperpigmentation. So the, the blue coloring of the skin that was, con, that was a concern with Plotiga. So definitely interesting, definitely new. We'll see kind of how things um, turn out. Kind of switching gears, as I mentioned before, not all clinical trials are just on, you know, traditional medications. There are also some that focus on, you know, foods, or um, in this case, it's medical food. So Kavita, this is a very interesting um, type of um, development where they had a feasibility study that they published in Brain Communications um, just within the last month or so, um, or at least within the last year, um, where they looked at medium chain triglycerides, and they tried to use this mechanism to help manage um, drug resistant epilepsy. So what they were trying to go at is a very similar type of technique as I guess somewhat like the ketogenic diet. However, the idea was that, you know, the ketogenic diet, if one is following it for epilepsy purposes, can be very difficult to follow. And that's actually part of the reason why many times adults um, are not typically staying on the ketogenic diet for a long period of time. And it also can be really difficult for children as well. Um, so this study was to look at the acceptability, tolerability, and compliance of this medical food called Kivita, um, which has like a ratio of different um, triglycerides. So basically what they did was they took adult patients and pediatric patients that had drug-resistant epilepsy and they took Kavita every day while having a somewhat, say, limited, like high refined sugary foods, but they could still have pasta and rice and things that you would not have during the ketogenic diet. And what they looked at is they looked at how many people, uh, you know, stayed through the completion of the study, um, how, um, what they said in their participant diary, um, and, you know, the acceptability and their intake of it. Now, there were 66% of the children that completed the study and 69% of adults completed the study. Some of the issues that people had and the primary reason why um, people decide not to, dis uh, not to continue in the study were that they had GI, you know, upset or constipation, some things that, can, um, that are similar to the ketogenic diet. They did note in the paper that they thought that, it, uh, that this problem decreased over time. But importantly, some of the interesting things is that there was a 50% reduction in the mean frequency of seizures. So they had 50% less seizures um, per month. And this was seen a little bit better in adults than in children. Um, they also looked at blood levels of medium chain fatty acids um, to see if that you know, correlated and those did, but not beta hydroxybutyrate. And when we look at the responder rate, as I mentioned before, so 
um, people that had a greater than 50% seizure reduction, 38% of children and 50% of adults achieved this. So had a greater than 50% decrease in their seizure um, levels. However, it's really important to note that if you look at the numbers in the study, it's a very small study. But it is really interesting. And you know, because this is a brain communication, I'm looking forward to seeing if there's any, um, if there's any follow-up to this and more studies where, you know, this could really be a great breakthrough and making it, you know, easier to have seizure control, um, you know, with benefits that are similar to the ketogenic diet, um, but, you know, without the stringent diet. Other, other kinds of studies that are going on, this is one that I just mentioned because I just thought it was really interesting. Um, but really hasn't, like they're planning to get into clinical trials actually this fall. Um, so this is Neurona Therapeutics is developing neuronal transplants um, to correct the excitatory to inhibitory balance. So basically in epilepsy, we think about that there's too much excitation and too little inhibition and, or like the breaks. Um, so these transplants were are thought to try to correct that. So their uh, transplant is called NRTX um, 1001. And these are, stem, these are human pluripotent stem cells that comprises interneurons, which are um, inhibitory neurons or break neurons that secrete GABA, which is the inhibitory signal. And the thought is by um, increasing the amount of break cells that you would be able to decrease the number of seizures. So their plan to deliver this, um, these neuronal transplants using MRI guided procedures directly into the hippocampus of the brain. And that is the area of the brain that, you know, is, is um, frequently affected in focal epilepsy, like your temporal lobe epilepsy, which is the most common type of um, adult onset um, epilepsy. So current research plans are, as I mentioned, you know, seeing how this can restore the imbalance in these areas. Um, they're going to actually, their um, plans per their website is that they're going to start doing these clinical trials at, um, within this quarter. We'll see. Um, it's another thing that I said, it's something to kind of keep our eye out for. Additionally, so that was talking about cell therapy, but there's also gene therapy that's going on, um, specifically in the area of Drave syndrome. Um, that is pretty exciting. This also came out just recently within the last month. Um, so Drave syndrome, as many of you are probably already aware, um, is a rare genetic epilepsy that's characterized by um, hard to control fever associated seizures and some, but also some, you know, seizures that are not associated with fevers. Also intellectual disability and motor disorders can also be things that are associated with it. Um, now, one of the things that's really interesting about Drave and is amazing is the fact that we've been able to find a gene that's associated with it. And this is the, the SCN1A gene. And over 80% of patients that have Drave have a mutation in this gene. And this gene encodes a sodium channel called NAV1.1, which is important for inhibition. So the break cells, um, the activity of the break cells that we talked about earlier. Now, despite medical therapy, 90% of Drave patients still continue to have seizures. Um, so Stoke Therapeutics is developing STK 001, um, which is an oligonucleotide, so a short bit of genetic material that they would um, use intrathecal administration to target this genetic cause of Drave. So what they're doing is using this like short bit of genetic material to restore the normal levels of NAV 1.1. So then there's more inhibition and therefore less excitation and hopefully then less seizures. Now they currently have two open label um, phase one, two A trials. There's the Monarch trial and the Admar trial. 
Um, Monarch trial is in the US and the Admiral trial is in the UK. And these studies are looking at the safety and the tolerability of this, um, of STK-001. And then of course, also as a secondary outcome, they want to take a look at how well this works against um, convulsive seizures. So the Monarch study um, has been looking um, once again, as I mentioned in Drave patients, so far they've done 21 patients. Um, the first patients actually um, were dosed in September. And there's an early trend towards a reduction in convulsive seizure frequency um, from baseline frequency. So meaning that the number of seizures that they had after, um, after receiving that dose of the STK-01 um, seems to be decreased, but it's very early, as I mentioned. But some of the really important things that were big questions before, because this is a different way of treating epilepsy, um, they wanted to know how well it was tolerated, and it seems like even up to higher doses that it was well tolerated. They wanted to know what were the side effects associated with it, and it seemed um, per their releases that there weren't um, that there weren't very severe. Um, effects associated with the study drug. There was also, um, they were also looking at how like the drug kind of, um, once it was dosed, how there was exposure within the body. So they looked at the CSF or the um, fluid that's within the area around the spinal cord. And they were actually able to measure um, the S, the S PK01, um, even up to six months after receiving a dose. Um, so just showing that, you know, it's still around and therefore the thought is that hopefully still active and that depending on the dose, if there was an increased dose, we saw an increased amount in the, um, in the body. And as I mentioned before, there's, there's um, a preliminary uh, trend towards um, it helping with convulsive seizures. So we'll kind of see what happens, um, but this is early data. This is also really interesting because this would actually be the first um, disease modifying therapy for epilepsy. Um, so we'll keep our eyes out and see kind of what happens. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit to a medication that we've that almost everyone is probably familiar with, levetiracetam or Keppra. Um, this was, um, this study was kind of came out within the last year and has got a lot of interest about how Keppra um, might help, you know, patients that have Alzheimer's disease. Um, so just to kind of give like a quick background. Um, so globally, there are estimated about 44 million patients with Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease is, you know, characterized by slow onset of, you know, cognitive deficits, short-term memory loss. And then often, you know, one of the earliest signs that we see is that, you know, they have loss of spatial navigation skills. So they have, you know, trouble, you know, finding their way in places that they were very familiar before. So there's an estimated, and once again, this is estimated, that there are 10 to 22% of Alzheimer's patients that develop seizures. And, um, and then there's also thought that there are 20 to 50% of them that have silent changes on their EEG or epileptic changes on their EEG. So what this study, um, which once again is very small, but it's very interesting, did was they wanted to look at what was, um, what was the effect of you know, starting Keppra in patients that had Alzheimer's disease. So they first started off with over 50 patients. They screened them overnight. Um, so they did an overnight EEG, and then they did a one hour meglo, um, magnetoencephalogram, which is a MEG, um, which uses magnetic waves to look for epileptic activity. And they screened the patients. After, random, after they um, kind of screened the patients, they ended up having 34 patients that um, ended up going into the different groups. Of those patients, 40% of those patients had epileptic activity, 
And these are patients that had not been um, diagnosed with seizures prior to this or any type of um, risk for that. What they did was at two academic medical centers, they um, had two groups, one group where they had a baseline period where you know they didn't receive anything. They then received Keppra or Levetiracetam. Um, and then they had a period again of four weeks after that where they didn't receive anything for it to wash out. And then they received four weeks of placebo. And then they had another group that did the opposite. And what they found was that there wasn't really, and they looked at you know executive functioning and they used some um, driving simulations and whatnot to look at you know, their cognitive abilities. And what they found was that there wasn't a difference in the executive functioning um, by using like NIH examiner, that was like one of um, the instruments that they used um, between the patients that got levetiracetam or placebo. But what they did find is that um, the patients that had silent epileptic activity, so the ones that had, you know, surprisingly had, you know, EEG changes, that they did have a clear benefit um, from uh, levetiracetam treatment. So one of the learnings that kind of come from this is, you know, although this is a small study, one of the things that we might think about is, you know, do we need to be screening more of our patients that have Alzheimer's disease? And what, and then I guess the other question is, you know, what is the appropriate type of study for that? Will a 20 minute routine EG that we typically do, will that be enough um, to know whether they're having this activity and could benefit? So those were just a few of the studies that I found, you know, really interesting that have come up, you know, even within like the last month. Um, now I'm gonna kind of switch gears um, again to how you can get involved if you want to get involved. So there are multiple different um, ways. The first place that I will direct you to is, you know, speaking to your epilepsy specialist. So, you know, talking to your epileptologist about um, what options are available um, locally. And sometimes they can even tell you about some of the ones that, you know, are specific for your type of epilepsy. Another tool that I wanted to make sure that I showed is that the Epilepsy Foundation actually has a really great tool online. It's called like the Clinical Trials Portal. I put the website here underneath as well. And it's really nice because it shows you the current trials and like the ones that are interventional as well as the ones that are observational. Um, other ones that are really good, um, there's um, Center Watch, which is not only for epilepsy, but when you go into the website, you can choose, you know, your type of epilepsy and that kind of stuff, and it can help you to find um, trials. And then if you're looking for a specific, you know, type of trial, you can get trial information from clinicaltrials.gov is another um, um, source. And to that end, I also wanted to mention that the Epilepsy Foundation has been working with the Human Epilepsy Project. Um, to do this study that's called HEP2 um, for resistant focal epilepsy. And, you know, basically it's been designed to understand, you know, the challenges that are associated with living with focal epilepsy that's not well controlled. And then also to kind of figure out biomarkers um, or like things that, you know, are signals to us that let us know, oh, this person's going to have more severe epilepsy, or this person is having a response to the treatment, you know, so then that helps us to develop better drugs, it helps us to develop better resources. Um, so I just want to drop this here, um, for if anybody's interested, um, some of the things that are inclusion criteria um, are just, you know, if you've been on, you know, multiple medications, so if you try four or more, um, you know, uh, 16, age 16 to 65, and then, you know, focal epilepsy with more than um, two seizures per month. This is a website um, for the Human Epilepsy Project. So also just another thing to kind of think about. So some key takeaways. Um, so although there are many medications for epilepsy, 
um, there are still one in three patients with uncontrolled seizures. Um, so we still have work to do. There are many clinical trials ongoing to address the need for better medications with better efficacy. So, you know, ones that work better, as well as ones that have less side effects, um, because that also makes it hard. Um, there are early studies, as I mentioned, that are looking to improve efficacy and side effects um, through small molecules, dietary uh, modifications, cell therapy, gene therapy, repurposing of the drugs that we already know. And actually, I didn't get to it today because of time, but also some devices as well. And lastly, there are many databases available to get involved with clinical trials, including um, the Epilepsy Foundation's clinical trial portal. Um, so that's something else to kind of check out. So that's all I have for today, um, but I welcome any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Armina. That was a great presentation. But if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. So we just had our first question pop in, uh, which is what is the compensation for participation in these trials, if there is any? That is a really good question. Um, so it really depends. Um, it depends on the study. Um, partly it can be associated with the risk that's involved, right? So. For instance, if you're going into a study like maybe the first one that I mentioned where it's taking, you know, taking a pill, um, that one, they're, they're usually a compensation, um, but it's not as much as say, the study that I mentioned before um, with um, the one from Stoke Therapeutics where they were looking at uh, the gene therapy, that one, um, where they're actually doing intrathecal, so putting the medication, you know, into the area around your spinal cord, like that is more invasive. So a lot of times the compensation will be higher for that. Um, so it really does vary, but it, you know, it can be substantial depending on the trial. Perfect, thank you. And looks like, um... Another question was, Bruviac is the same family as Keppra. I wonder if the Bruviac would work the same way as helping with Alzheimer's too. That is a really good question. My thought would be that likely it would, um, but you know, obviously we'd have to do you know, clinical trials to be able to tell whether that's the case because there are some key differences in it, but because it is in the same family, I wouldn't be surprised if it did have similar effects. And um, there are some thoughts um, that it's supposed to be a little bit easier on mood, which would also be really helpful in the Alzheimer's um, population as well. Great, a couple of people said, thank you. Very informative presentation. Our next question is how long does it normally take to get through the four phases of a clinical trial? Ooh, very, very good question. And I will definitely, I think actually this is something that I'll probably add into my next talk because I think it's really important to note. Um, so the beginning part actually is maybe a little bit, so if they're, they're it really depends on which type of population you're talking about. So if it's a population or it's a bigger population, you know, of, you know, let's say temporal lobe epilepsy versus, you know, someone who has a very rare epilepsy, um, it can take a lot longer to recruit the patients for the, for the smaller study. But then also you don't need as many patients. So 
there's kind of give and take, but it's years before these medications typically are able to come to market. Um, typically it takes months to get through um, phase one and phase two, usually like a year to two years, phase three, depending on, you know, like outcomes that and recruitment, as I mentioned before, like trying to get patients in, um, it, it can vary, but yes, it's definitely a year's type process. And I'm, and I'm really starting like in this presentation, you know, talking about when you start from like clinical trials, but there's so much work that happens before that, where you have biologists and chemists in labs that are thinking about, you know, which targets would be new and would be able to help patients. And there are so many medications that die, <laughs> meaning like they don't go forward, even to the, even to the point of doing phase one. Um, so it's really a long process when you start from like the actual target, um, like figuring out which protein you're gonna target all the way to the end of having like an approved medication. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty incredible how long the, the clinical trials just to, to get one approved, like all the work that goes in and takes. I think you did a really great job of kind of bringing that to light there. Um, the next question is, have, have they noticed Keppra rages in patients with Alzheimer's disease? That is a really good question. Um, so I think, I think that that is one, a really good question because we know that Keppra can be associated with that. Um, they didn't mention it in that study, but remember that study is very small, right? Um, so then everything is kind of more, you know, based on, you know, the provider's experience. Um, typically at lower doses, it's not so much of an issue, but each patient is different. Um, and there are also some mood changes that happen with Alzheimer's disease as well. Um, so it really makes it kind of difficult to tease apart, but definitely something that one would have to, you know, be thoughtful of for sure. Great. It looks like a few more questions came in. Um, the next one is when is the Zen 1101 and the Vita available for the public or did these clinical trials just start recently? So they just started recently. Um, so the, so the Zen 1101 is further along um, than the KVDA. Um, as I mentioned, these are just things that I'm just kind of putting, putting out there on the radar as things that are coming up. Um, there are many different steps in the process um, for the Xenon compound. That one has um, larger studies. Like I said, there were like over 300 patients in there. So there are a whole lot closer potentially to approval depending on their results. Um, whereas um, the Kivita is very early. Um, but you know, you just never know. And especially depending on which population they're looking at, certain populations, when you look at them in clinical trials, the FDA knows that there are certain populations that have a lot of trouble with um, a lot of trouble with um, their epilepsy and there are really rare uh, group. So then they will allow things to kind of, you know, they will review it a lot quicker than some of the other ones. So it kind of depends on how they decide to go through that process. Perfect. Thank you. And the next person is asking, looks like they've been on Keppra for several, ye several years and their seizures are well controlled. Um, but they're wondering, are there any, I guess, maybe side effects or long-term side effects that people should, should be aware of with Keppra? So that is a, that's a good question. Um, so typically, so because I don't know like the whole, um, like your whole medical history, I can't speak to specifically your risk, but in general, I have, I had many patients that were on Keppra and like long-term there weren't um, many effects that we had to worry about that, you know, we would see with some of the other medications. Um, so, so far, we haven't seen anything that we need to really be concerned about from a long-term per perspective. The biggest thing that we worry about with our patients is, you know, making sure that they have, you know, good 
tolerability and that they're also having good control of their seizures because, you know, that increases, you know, if you have increased convulsive seizures, that increases your risk of, you know, sudden unexplained death and epilepsy. So we're very like, that's why, you know, we really try and target those types of seizures. I'm glad to hear that you have great control, um, but I wouldn't, Keppra is not one of the medications that we more so worry about long-term effects with um, because so far it's had a really great safety profile. Okay, great. that's great to hear, thank you. Um, and then another question is, do you know the names of, of the new drugs, if any, coming out in the next year? Yeah, so good question. So typically they don't really, um, they don't really make the names, I guess, until like later on in the process. So very early in the process, they will have, um, they will use, you know, these types of um, like numbers. Um, one, one way that you can kind of follow up on it, if you're interested, is a lot of times you can type those names into uh, clinicaltrials.gov and they like, they have a nice way of like, it pulls up everything. So even when they actually come up with a name for it, um, all of that data is linked, which is really helpful because, you know, you, you wanna be able to get all the data together. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we don't know what they're going to name them yet. Okay, great, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and then it looks like the last question we have right now is, is there a way to stay on a study list to review your history to determine disparities and inequities and not necessarily to change medications? Ooh, that, that, that's good. That's a really good, that's a really good question. That, that actually, I think is really an area of need. Um, because I think that people are interested. Um, I think that probably some of the ways um, that I know of right now is getting involved with, um, for instance, if you are at a tertiary care center for epilepsy, that can be easy because you just talk with your, you know, epileptologist or, you know, your epilepsy specialist and say, you know, this is what I'm interested in. Please keep me abreast um, of anything that's coming up that's new. And typically like they know kind of like what's coming through. So as soon as they, you know, get information about it that they can, you know, share that with you. It would really be nice if there was kind of like a list where, you know, you're able to just kind of share it with everyone. I, right now, I am not aware of that, but that, that definitely would be awesome. And I think maybe that's something even to think about. I, I, absolutely, that's a, that's, that's a great way to, to answer that question, I think. And, and that's a great question to raise. Um, so as of right now, those are all, all the questions that we have. Um, a lot of great questions for, for Dr. Omali. And um, I mean, we really appreciate you um, presenting to our, our group today. It was a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, and so we just, again, thank you for, for all your support, all you're doing for the epilepsy community and, and everything. And enjoy the rest of your weekend and rest of the conference. Thank you. You too. And thank you so much for allowing me to get involved. I absolutely love this. Oh, thank you. We appreciate it and look forward to continuing to have you involved and in, in working together. All right, everyone. Well, now we are going to go on one final break and we will start our last speaker of the day, Kelly McKee from OVR at 12.15.
Okay, welcome back everyone. So it is time to move on to our final speaker of today. I would like to introduce Kelly McKee. Kelly is a vocational rehabilitation supervisor with a decade of personal and professional experience in vocational rehabilitation. Kelly is a graduate of Penn State University and earned a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling from George Washington University, a member of the National Rehabilitation Association. She was a Pennsylvania Rehabilitation Association graduate student award winner in the area of advocacy, a strong believer in competitive integrated employment and equal opportunity for persons with disabilities Kelly works on a daily basis to promote the mission of the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation to assist individuals with disabilities in securing and maintaining employment. Kelly is also a proud mother of three children and two dogs. So thank you so much for joining us today, Kelly. And at this time, I will hand it over to you. Kelly, it looks like we got you on mute, sorry. Thank you, my goodness. Okay. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen. So I'm, I'm not very, um, uh, there we go. Zoom is making this easy for me. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. No, absolutely. Uh, excellent. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, as um, said, I work for the Pennsylvania Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, I am a transition supervisor. Um, I work out of the Harrisburg District Office. Uh, at the end of the program, there will also be information about contact information for the Philadelphia office as well. So our mission at um, OVR is to assist Pennsylvanians with disabilities to secure, maintain, and advance in employment and independence. Our agency overview is that we um, at OVR were under the um, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. There are 15 district offices for the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation Services, six district offices for the Bureau of Blind and Visual Services. We have the Hiram G. Andrews Center, HGAC, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And then our Bureau of Central Operations for OVR, that is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Here's the OVR district office map. You can see OVR has offices in Erie, Newcastle, Pittsburgh, Washington, Du Bois, Altoona, Johnstown, Williamsport, Wilkes-Barre, Allentown, Reading, Harrisburg, York, Norristown, and Philadelphia. The organization within each district office um, is that there is a district administrator Mm -hmm. There's an assistant district administrator. There's clerical support staff, supervisors, and then there are business representatives, vocational rehabilitation counselors, early reach coordinators, vision rehabilitation therapists, orientation and mobility specialists, and social workers. At the Hiram G. Andrews Center, um, there are support services. Hiram G. Andrews Center is a comprehensive training facility. The support services offered are um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, 
psychological services. There's a center for assistive and rehabilitative services. They offer vocational assessment, workforce development training, cognitive skills enhancement programs, center for occupational readiness, pre-employment transition programming. Um, on this slide, they have we have a website for HGAC there. Um, the, within HGAC, there's all, also the Commonwealth Technical Institute, and that has degree and diploma programs, and there is a specific website for that as well. So how is a referral made to OVR? So referrals are made um, through an online pre-application process. And it can um, start by going to our website, which is included here um, on this slide, or um, you can also go directly to a career link uh, website. We are also linked with career links. And you can also coordinate with your local OVR office because at each and every OVR office, there's someone designated to help with the pre-application process online. Um, for anyone who um, is not tech savvy or might not have access um, to a computer, there is help at the district office level with that pre-application process. So what does the OVR process look like? Well, here's a little overview and then we'll look at each step in the process. So the, first the customer completes the pre-application for services. Then they meet with a counselor for an initial intake. Then the counselor does the eligibility determination which places the customer on an order of selection. Then the counselor works with the customer to prepare an individualized plan for employment, the IPE. Then service provision takes place. Um, on that IPE, there are goals. So through the service provision, we wanna see achievement of the goals and then successful case closure. Eligibility, so eligibility um, for OVR services, in order to be determined eligible for OVR, you must meet the following criteria. You have a disability that is a physical, mental, or emotional impairment, which results in substantial impediment to employment. And you can benefit in terms of an employment outcome from services provided and Vocational rehabilitation services are required for you to prepare for, cure, retain, advance in, or regain employment. There is an order of selection, and the selection categories are most significantly disabled, significantly disabled, and non-significantly disabled. For most significantly disabled, the impairment seriously limits three or more functional capacities, and you would expect to be um, required two or more VR services to last six months or more from the date of your IPE. Significantly disabled category, the impairment or impairment seriously limit one or more functional capacities. And again, there would be the expectation um, to require two or more VR services that would last six months from the date of the IPE. And then for the non-significantly disabled category, the individual has a physical, mental, or sensory impairment that does not meet the definitions of most significantly disabled or significantly disabled. Order of selection wait list. So thank goodness we no longer have this, um, but we did. Um, 
experience a wait list um, recently. And, um, and that was just due to a, a shortage in funding. And um, we now um, are fully funded and um, there is no wait list. When we did have a wait list, there was a job retention exemption so that um, if someone was at, media, at immediate risk of losing their job um, due to their disability, they could bypass that wait list. Cost for OVR services. Um, it does not cost anything to apply for OVR. There's no cost associated with diagnostic services, vocational evaluations, vocational counseling and guidance, or job placement assistance. Depending on income, there may be a participant contribution for cost services. We have a financial needs test that's completed prior to the provision of any cost services to identify what if any contribution from a customer would be expected. Individuals receiving social security benefits based on their own disability are exempt from the financial needs test and will not have a contribution for cost services. And at, we have a little reminder here, OVR cannot pay for services that have already occurred without prior written authorization from OVR. BVRS services include, this is an overview, we have vocational counseling and guidance, diagnostic services, vocational evaluation, restoration services, placement services, post-secondary training, supported employment services, business services, and pre-employment transition services. And we'll look at each of those services. We're gonna start with vocational counseling and guidance. The purpose here is to support individuals throughout the vocational rehabilitation process. So our vocational counselors work with customers um, as needed, it could be weekly um, they meet, could be monthly, they meet to assist with identifying and understanding the customer's interests, strengths and abilities, transferable skills, functional limitations, accommodations and resources to navigate and overcome barriers to employment. Um, they look, can look at labor market research, look at realistic vocational goals, so discover and unlock potential. That's what the counselor and customer are working together toward. What a diagnostic services, so what does that look like? Well, the purpose of diagnostic services is to better understand the individual's functional limitations and need for services. So how can we best help this customer and an example um, of a diagnostic service might include a, a medical um, diagnostic service, um, psychological, audiological, or visual. Vocational evaluation. So the purpose of that is to understand an individual's vocational potential. So testing, might include aptitude, interest, general ability, academic levels, work tolerance, hands-on job experience. And um, Hiram G. Andrews Center, they have vocational evaluations and um, look at um, you know, what type of educational program there at HGAC might be a good fit um, for an individual that might want to attend that, that program. Restoration services. So we also have that restoration services that help individuals achieve independence and assist 
with pursuing a career. Examples of that might include physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological services, wheelchairs, driver's evaluation and training, prosthetics and orthotics, assistive technology, vehicle modifications, home modifications, and medical equipment. And all these services are to help individuals overcome barriers to employment. Placement services. So the purpose of our placement services is to prepare, help customers prepare for engagement with employers and actively seek employment opportunities. Examples would include resume building, um, interviewing skills, job search, job application, and job leads. So here, a vocational counselor would work with a customer um, to prepare and make them job ready. Post-secondary training. The purpose is to further education to prepare for employment via measurable skills gains. And examples would include vocational or technical training, certificate programs, two-year community college programs, four-year college programs, and graduate school. And, and there is a note that um, support for post-secondary training is determined on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the individual's goals, financial need, and educational history. And all of our services are on a case-by-case -case basis. They are laid out um, between the customer and the counselor and placed on that individualized plan for employment that um, those services, our services are a pathway to um, help the customer achieve their goal of employment. Supported employment. So supported employment um, can have community-based work and assessments um, to evaluate an individual skill set via hands-on assessment and determine level of support needed on the job. Also performance-based supported employment for those who need job development and intensive on-site support. And we also offer discovery and customized employment for those who have not been successful with traditional supported employment or who don't appear to be job ready um, per traditional assessment methods or who are likely to meet competitive work demands even with supported employment services. So they're unlikely um, to be successful with regular supported employment services. And that, that looks like um, a customer who might need some assistance from a job coach um, to learn job tasks when, when a job. Um, they also could need some assistance of uh, finding a job. Um, maybe they're not the best at, at filling out applications. Um, and maybe the counseling and guidance from the OVR counselor isn't quite enough support. They need more intensive support. Um, supported employment services could include a job coach that would help the customer with those more intensive supports. Um, supported employment continued. So also um, job retention services for those who are in danger of losing their job and in need of on-site support. We also offer job mentoring services for those who do not require on-site support, but need job search assistance and or intensive and frequent off-site support to maintain employment. There are intermittent supported employment services for open cases that didn't anticipate the need for on-site support, but now require short-term on-site support in order to maintain employment, including those receiving job mentoring services. 
We also offer business services. So employers are actually OVR's dual customers. Um, job seekers are our customers, but also um, the employer can be a customer of OVR. Services offered to business customers include referral of pre-screened candidates who have the appropriate skills, abilities, training, and qualifications to perform essential job duties, um, consult, consulting services to help retain current employees, accommodation solutions to allow new or current employees to achieve productive employment, disability adequate training, job analysis and work site modification consultation, information about assistive technology and available resources, incentives for hiring individuals with disabilities, and on the job training initiative. So all of our local offices have business services and our business services are always looking to collaborate with local employers who want to hire individuals with disabilities. We owe us. So this is the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act. And I'm gonna give a brief overview of that. This is what has um, expanded OVR's role in transition services. So some background is that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was signed by President Obama on July 22nd, 2014. It replaces the Workforce Investment Act mm -hmm. of 1998. It amends the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The purpose of WIOA is designed to help job seekers access employment, education, training, and support services to succeed in the labor market and to match employers with the skilled workers they need to compete in the global economy. WIOA made a large impact in many areas, one of which is the provision of transition services for youth with disabilities. And on our slide here, there is a, um, a website that you can go for more information. So now we'll talk for a minute about pre-employment transition services. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the purpose of pre-employment transition services is to increase the employment rate of students with disabilities in the state of Pennsylvania. Pre-employment transition services are preparatory services for students with disabilities to identify career interests, practice, and improve work skills and explore post-secondary training opportunities at an early age to maximize their potential to enter competitive integrated employment. 15% of OVR's VR budget must be allocated to pre-employment transition services and they're commonly referred to as PETS or PREMIT services. Pre-EDS eligibility requirements. So a student with a disability is an individual with a disability in a secondary, post-secondary, or other recognized education program who is at least 14 years of age, not older than 21 years of age, is eligible for and receiving special education or related services under IDEA, is an individual with a disability for the purpose of Section 504. And that basically means that they have an IEP or a 504 plan in school. So the five required pre-ETS activities that OVR offers are self-advocacy instruction, 
workplace readiness training, job exploration counseling, counseling on opportunities for enrollment in comprehensive transition or post-secondary educational programs, and work-based learning. Priets um, continued, we offered um, group services and individual services uh, for Priets. And um, group Priets are um, provided by our early reach coordinators or a provider, and they're typically facilitated through the school via the school profile. The school profile determines the transition needs of the school to ensure that OVR is supplementing and not supplanting transition services. They can be delivered via internal OVR staff or an external provider, and that internal staff are our early reach coordinators. Eligible or potentially eligible students may participate. They do not need to have an open case with OVR to participate in group services. Individual pre-employment transition services. The, the student must have an open case, and that means they've completed a pre-application and an initial intake with a counselor. And Individual services can be delivered via an internal OVR staff, a counselor, or an external provider. Special programming. So there are pre ed special programming and it varies per district office. Um, we have project search sites throughout the state there is a Bureau of Blind and Visual Services Summer Academy, a Deaf and Hard of Hearing Summer Academy, Early Reach Academy, we have that in the Harrisburg District Office. HGAC has free at academies and programming. Um, this past summer, we started summer programming um, with a My Work initiative and a professional connections experience. And it, it depends on the district office, but in the Harrisburg office, um, we had a program for each and um, the My Work paired um, students with municipalities. And we actually worked with the city of Harrisburg um, and students were paid to beautify um, places throughout the city. And, um, and that was really a neat program. And then also the professional connections experience, um, students receive some um, job shadowing experience with local employers. So they get, go, get to go out and um, job shadow and, and look at different work experiences. Um, out in the community. And then they also have some classroom time where they're learning about careers and exploring career options. So the pre ed continuum, um, and this is what we hope for an OVR, is that there's career exploration and preparation where the student gains introductory skills and enters the workplace for short periods of time. And then we move to career engagement where students increase their knowledge of jobs while gaining employability skills and some entry level skills. And then career experience and planning where students gain experience in an occupation of interest. So OVR's mission is to assist Pennsylvanians with disabilities to secure, maintain, and advance in employment and independence. We work with individuals of all walks of life. All services are individualized to assist in successfully preparing for, obtaining, and maintaining employment. 
overall goal was to empower OVR customers to unlock and maximize their potential and assist in achieving competitive integrated employment. And then here is my contact information, my email. You can always reach out to me to get information about OVR. And also Sherry Brightville. She is the district administrator at the Philadelphia office. And she is always welcome um, to help as well. And her phone number and office hours are there. And then also we've included the OVR district office directory website where you can go to the website and find the directory for all the OVR district offices that will have the phone numbers for there. So hmm. I will take questions now. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, of course. So if anyone does have questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat box. And it looks like we already did have a couple come through. And the first one is asking, are there any, any way the uh, things that would make like a customer or a person ineligible, I guess, for OVR? Well, um, if the person has a verified disability, um, you know, so if someone wasn't, didn't have a diagnosis, um, now you can come to OVR and you can even get evaluated. So um, maybe you've been through school, you struggled in school a little bit, um, but you made it through, but now you're struggling on the job and you know something's not quite right and you're thinking maybe there's, a, you know, you have a learning disability or um, maybe adult ADHD, you can come to, to, um, to OVR and we can do an evaluation for that. And, um, and, and that could help then with your determination of eligibility. But the, the main factor is that um, you have a disability and that you have some barriers to employment, that you need our services to overcome barriers to employment. That answers the question. Yes, I think that was very helpful. Thank you, Kelly. And then the next question that somebody asked, uh, uh, saying that they've been out of work for 15 years uh, due to epilepsy, but saying that if they can return to work, um, if their epilepsy improved um, and they were to start working again, could they start at making the same amount they were making before or would they have to start at the bottom again or maybe not be making as much? Well, and, and that's hard. That really um, is up to the employer. So, and, and let me just make sure I hear the question right, but you know, you've maybe, you've been in a job and maybe you've had to leave that job. Um, and then, and that was due to, you know, a barrier that your employment, that your um, disability um, or your diagnosis created. And then you come back to the job and, you know, would the employer need to pay you the same amount? And, and the answer to that is, I guess it would just really to depend is if you completely left the job, um, you know, were you on, um, were they able to, you know, give you family medical leave? And so you didn't lose your position completely um, and you're coming back to the same exact position and, you know, but um, if you left the job completely and were starting back again fresh, um, the employer would have the right to pay you whatever, um, whatever they would deem appropriate for that work position. Does that make sense? And does that answer the question? 
Yes, I think that that's a good um, able way to, to clear it up that it really depends on the em employer and, and the job itself, depending that makes the decision on what the pay range is. It really does. And, and that, it brings up a good point because that's what OVR is here for too, is mm -hmm. hopefully we don't get to the point where somebody is losing their job. We really want to help people um, not just, you know, gain employment, but maintain employment so that if your disability or your diagnosis is causing you an issue at your job, reach out to OVR and, and you know, we can work with you to try and help you overcome that barrier. We um, work with employers, um, you know, if it, if there is just a question of, you know, maybe you don't know how to approach it. You can work with the counselor to discuss how to approach things like that with your employer. Um, we're there to provide that type of support. Yeah, absolutely. And it sees our next question for you, Kelly, is I see there's customized plans. Have you worked with employers who understand that some employees are only physically and or mentally able to work four to, four to eight hours a week? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and, and we are seeing um, employers now be more flexible um, to accept individuals who can't work as many hours of, as 40 a week. So a lot of times we have um, customers who come to us to say, we want part-time work. That's okay. That's fine. We can find employers and we can find jobs that, that will fit that need um, for that customer. And um, employers are more ready now than ever before to, um, to hire part-time employees. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, and the next question is, if you are, are on disability, since you are unable to work any of the previous types of jobs, how will you help define new interests if those were the jobs that you loved? Right, that, that's so, um, such a difficult thing. I, I happen to be an individual myself who I worked in a field and um, then I, I had a, a, an accident, I became disabled and, and that really wasn't then the field for me to be in anymore. And I had to look for, um, you know, for another type. Of, of employment and OVR helped. My OVR counselor, we worked together. We did interest inventories to look at other things. We, um, and that's why we're working with students too early on because we want to give um, individuals the opportunity to see employment experiences that are out there. You can work with your OVR counselor to look at um, virtual job shadows so you can see, you know, what does it look like to be an accountant? What does it look like to be an assistant to an accountant? What are other jobs in the accounting field or all various fields, the legal field, you know, um, criminal justice or, um, you know, so many different job fields out there um, that you can explore with your OVR counselor to find interest to help you um, resettle in, in a job that meets all your needs and is a good fit for you. Perfect, thank you, Kelly. And this next person is asking, um, looks like from, uh, looks like they asked uh, one of the earlier questions, I guess they're asking when you do an assessment and you determine that someone is el ineligible for OBR, um, what are the reasons that a disability would make someone ineligible for support from OVR? So, think about that. Um, well, they, they may just not have the barriers to employment um, that 
are there and you saw our different categories um, of uh, most significantly disabled, significantly disabled. Um, if, you know, would use that order of selection to determine that. And you can see that for most significantly disabled, um, impairment seriously limits three or more functional capacities. So, you know, there's gonna be some, some challenges, three or more challenges there. And, um, and then for significantly, you're looking at just one or more. So you can see that, um, you know, usually somebody with a disability is going to be eligible. Um, if you're not significantly disabled, then the individual has a physical, mental, or sensory impairment that does not meet um, the most significantly or significantly disabled, which means there just aren't, aren't a lot of barriers to employment there. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good way of, of putting it. There's certain criteria that you, you don't clearly went over, and it's really a a case by case, like each individual is very different and, and need their own assessment and everything like that. Exactly, yep. And you will work with your OBR counselor, that pre-application and then that initial meeting with the counselor, you'll be discussing that and looking at all the um, challenges that there could be um, looking for employment or within employment, and um, and usually there are things that OVR can help with. Yeah, absolutely. And one person did comment that they um, worked in the with the Montgomery uh, office of OVR about thirty years ago, um, I believe, and they found the services that you guys offer um, very helpful and very beneficial for them. And they even had a job coach, I believe, from OBR. Oh, that's awesome. That's so nice to hear. Um, it's so great to hear when the services work, work well. Um, there are some customers that maybe they, they do get signed up in high school and, um, and they leave high school and they're just fine. They, they got their job or, you know, they're in their degree program, everything's going well, they get hired, everything's good and they didn't really need us, um, you know, and that's great too. And then there's other customers that maybe they need a vehicle modified, um, you know, to get back and forth to work. Um, you know, maybe they need some assistive technology on the job um, to help them um, communicate. Maybe they need that job coach um, to be that support, whether it be um, learning the job or there for mental, emotional support, um, whatever it, it may be. Um, working with an OVR counselor, you really can, can determine. Um, there are so many ways that OVR can be um, can be helpful and supportive. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And looks like we have a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, what types of incentives are available to businesses for hiring people with disabilities? Can employees or potential employees present this opportunity to their place of employment to help with retention or make their job application more attractive? We, there are tax incentives, and that is something that our business services office specializes in. Um, so, it, and it's it's not hard. We um, it's not hard for an employer um, to to file for that tax um, incentive, and it definitely is something that um, customers can say it's out there. Um, 
There are tax credits that are out there as well. And um, if you're connected with OVR, we have our, a business services representative and even a specialist at our central office that can assist the customer and the employer in providing that information and walking the employer through that process so that they can feel secure in, in what they're doing um, to, to get that tax incentive and that tax credit. And then one other thing is that we do offer, um, also offer federal bonding. We have a specialist um, to assist with that. So if an employer um, wants a customer bonded for some reason, um, we can assist with the cost and, um, and see that that customer's bonded so that employer can feel safe in hiring that customer. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Kelly. Looks like our other question is, a client's son is on the spectrum, high functioning, and has two degrees from Cornell. Um, they can't seem to ace an interview. However, they have trouble. Looks like they have difficulty with eye contact um, during the interview. Do you have resources to help with a situation like that? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we see that, um, you know, it um, challenges and, and barriers, they range. It, it doesn't just mean that, you know, you, you couldn't obtain a, a degree. You still might have um, some challenges, um, you know, interviewing. And, um, and we absolutely, that's exactly what we're here for. We're not going to say because you know, someone has two degrees, you know, there's not a barrier to employment. We know that's not the case. Um, so that is exactly what an OVR counselor is there to do. I would say in that circumstance, the counselor would probably work um, really hard to do the best that they could um, to work with that customer to improve those skills. Um, you know, doing mock interviews, working with business services um, intensively with that customer. But if that wouldn't be the case um, and the customer couldn't overcome that barrier, then, you know, somebody, someone like a job coach um, could even work further with that customer and, um, and be that intermediate between the employer and the customer. And our business service representatives can do that as well. Um, they've worked to be that intermediate with the um, employer to explain that, you know, this customer is, is, you know, very good fit for this job, has all the talents, the skills, the abilities, may not be the greatest interviewer. And so um, how can we we um, we you know work with that customer and you and the, and the employer to make that interview successful so that customer can highlight all those great talent skills and abilities that they have at the ready. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. And it looks like we have one more question um, for you today. The person, I believe they're asking that they were at work, but they had to um, be out of work due to their epilepsy or having an accident um, on the job. Are you ever able to assist with someone being able to return to that same employer? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, we would definitely work to be and, you know, um, supportive to the customer and in, intermediate mm -hmm. um, to, you know, intermediate between the customer and the employer. Um, I had a, um, a customer who um, she was just struggling on the job. Again, you know, um, she had had problems back in high school, but thought everything was situated. So now this came up, won a job. 
She wanted to keep that job. Um, she didn't know what to do. The employer didn't know how to help. Um, so, you know, she came to us. We went in, um, assessed the situation, took a look at the job and um, looked at what some of the barriers could be and how could we overcome those barriers and worked with the employer to put a plan in place to make that job a better fit. Um, we looked at accommodations. What, what type of accommodations are available? Um, you know, the customer still has to be able to do the essential functions of a job, but, you know, can they do that with an accommodation? And um, what, what does, you know, individuals, um, sometimes employers, a manager might not even know what accommodation would be appropriate. OVR is there to help, to show that employer, we, you know, this could be helpful. Um, we could do this to make things better so that employee can maintain their job. And an employer a lot of times doesn't want to have to retrain and doesn't want to have to spend more money to hire new people. They'd rather keep an employee that they already have trained. So let us see what accommodation we could get in place to make this one barrier doable so we can overcome that so this person can keep their job. Perfect, thank you, Kelly. And looks like that is all the questions um, we have for you today. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend and presenting um, you know, the great programs and services that OVR offer to people with disabilities and people in the epilepsy community. We, we really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I am so grateful to be here to share OVR. Many times people say it's a hidden, it, it's a, um, a hidden resource. So we want it people, we don't want it to be hidden anymore. We want everyone to know it's out there. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree. And thank you again. Thank you. All right, everyone. So uh, we just finished up our final speaker for the day, but we just want to finish talking about some things about uh, how you can be involved with the foundation and some of our upcoming events as well. So how you can be involved with the Epilepsy Foundation is, you know, you can help raise awareness, um, you know, sharing your story, whether that's to, you know, sharing it with family, friends, posting on social media as well. We're always looking to share local community members' stories. Joining support groups and helping share your story is a great way. We have multiple volunteer opportunities. Um, always looking for epilepsy warriors and people who can be advocates. We have a new uh, camp and volunteer outreach uh, coordinator who's really wonderful um, that can be contacted and you can reach out to me to be put in contact with them about volunteer opportunities. Um, you know, we invite you to reach out to us to come out to a school, a local business, um, you know, a workplace, a first responders near you, and we're happy to help lead a seizure recognition and first aid training for your local community, also for the general public, family and friends. We encourage you to attend and fundraise our different EF EPA events. We have our walks, our conferences, we have a Mardi Gras gala, and we have a couple upcoming events that are going to be really great. Um, you know, we encourage you to visit our main website, EFEPA.org, with our main events, our different programs and services. You can follow us on social media. Uh, our Facebook page is Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at EFEPA. So upcoming, um, we have our pediatric surgery webinar series, and that is going to be starting on November 1st. And it's going to be on November 1st, the 9th, 15th and 29th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Um, so for more information and to register, you can 
visit here efepa.org slash webinars dash trainings and for more information you can contact our program director Rena Lachlan and here's her email and work phone number. Upcoming on Tuesday, November 2nd from 6 to 7 p.m. we have our La Epilepsia E2. It's a Spanish epilepsy educational webinar. Um, which is going to be really great for our Spanish speaking community. So if you know anyone interested in attending or you're interested yourself, we encourage you um, to attend. The webinar will be in Spanish. Um, and again, you can visit here to register and find more information at efepa.org slash webinars dash trainings. And for more information, you can contact Alan Baca at luv at efepa.org. We have a upcoming Strikeout Epilepsy Bullathon on Sunday, November 7th from 3 to 5 p.m. at Chaco's in Wilkes-Barre, PA. So if you are local to Wilkes-Barre, PA, or you know someone, or you're interested in making the drive up there, um, it's going to be a great event, a lot of fun. Um, it's $15 to bowl for the shoes. Uh, there's going to be pizza, drinks different raffles, a great chance to just get out, show off your bowling skills, um, you know, connect with others in the community and just to help, you know, raise funds for epilepsy and epilepsy awareness. And you can contact Mary Lachlan at her work phone number right here or her email address, epilepsywv at efepa.org for more questions and to also register. And then upcoming on Saturday, November 20th at 7 o'clock at the Philadelphia Flyers game, the EFEPA and Paul's Purple, Paul's Purple Warriors will be having an epilepsy awareness outing. Um, so we have tickets, uh, there will be tickets available, $75 on the lower level and $50 on the upper level. Um, we really encourage you to come out to this great event, root on the hometown Flyers. You know, hopefully they'll bring home a win, but um, we've had a lot of people already register for this. It's going to be a great event. You'll be seated in the lower and upper levels with additional people who are attending for epilepsy awareness. We're going to have a lot of community members coming out, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. So if you or you know anyone interested, you know, you can get tickets right here, and you can also reach out to us with any questions about the event. And then hopscotch and paces. Um, Anna touched base about hopscotch, but again, me and Rena are memory coaches at the Epilepsy Foundation for hopscotch. And it is a program for adults living with epilepsy that can be done virtually um, through Zoom over the phone to help with memory and cognition. And if you are interested in this program, again, it is free of charge. There's no cost to it. You can contact me at my email, smorgan at efepa.org, or you can call our main office uh, to get connected with me. And we also recently started PACES, um, which is another program for adults living with epilepsy. And PACES is a psychoeducational group um, where we, it has an average of about six to 10 community members. And we are currently finishing up our first uh, group. They'll be finishing up at early November and we'll be looking to start a new group in the new year. So between November and December, we'll be looking for new participants. It's a really great group to connect with others. Um, we talk about different topics, one on memory cognition, stress and the blues, you know, proper ways of dealing with your, your epilepsy. It's a great educational group, very supportive environment. And again, that is a virtual group. It's free of charge, no cost. So if you are ever interested in um, participating in one of our PACES groups, you can visit, um, again, efepa.org slash PACES, and you can reach out to me by email or our main office, and we'll get make sure you get connected with me. So lastly, you know, November is National Epilepsy Awareness Month. I know we have Halloween and all coming up this weekend, but that just means that Monday, November 1st is going to be National Epilepsy Awareness Month. And we at the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania are your local friends and partners in the fight against epilepsy. We want you to know we're always here for you, your family, and friends to help provide free support services, educational programs like today, seizure first aid trainings, 
multiple different resources and referrals, you know, along with also bringing that sense of community and a circle of support, which we all know is so important. And we know it's a year round effort um, for epilepsy, but November is really our month long chance to talk about epilepsy, really increase that raising awareness efforts, help inspire action and create change. If you want to get involved or help take action this November, you can head to www.efepanovember.org to learn more, or you can contact me by email or my phone, our phone number, and that's my extension, and we'll make sure to get you connected with either me uh, or the right contact, your local resource coordinator, or who's ever involved with an event or an idea that you have for helping raise awareness. So again, thank you all for attending today. I am going to be launching a post-conference uh, survey that was just launched. If you could please fill that out. Um, it's just a few questions and then you could submit it. I'd be greatly appreciated. Um, again, thank you to our speakers, all four who were great today. Tiffany, um, who was our, our keynote. Oh. Um, that. Tiffany, who was our keynote, um, then Anna, Armina, and Kelly, you are all really wonderful. We really appreciate it. And thank you from our, our, um, our sponsors as well. We couldn't have done it without you. And thank you to all of our community members. We appreciate it. So thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. You know, have a great weekend. Um, have a great and safe holiday, and please know we're always here as a resource.